I'm recording this to the cloud. You see, this is the spring semester. And <clears throat> what happened in the fall in this particular class is a community formed. You, uh, Ma was in that class. And as you will recall, the very last thing that happened in that class in our 795 week 15 was what, Yua, do you remember the very last thing? I believe Kim shared a video of her wedding and we all got emotional and we start commenting and support each other. So it was really nice. We all cried at the end. I cannot promise that you will take this class in the spring semester with me and you will be crying on week 15. And I, I, I will promise that you won't be crying because you got bad grades. I'm going to try and support you so you get good grades in here uh, and good, get quality dissertations. But we all cried because Kim's mother said she loved Kim in the video of their wedding from last summer. And you know, back and forth, they said they love each other. And Kim's mother died during the semester. It was passed, passed away. So it got real emotional for Kim. It got real emotional for all the students in the class. And there were some subgroups that formed in the spring semester and some sharing that happened across the different groups, which is really good um, to, to see that occur spontaneously to some degree. In the spring, we had seven EDD students and one uh, PhD student. This time we have four and four. So it, it makes me think more about what I can provide to the PhD students who I didn't necessarily ignore, but I think I, I focused a little bit on making sure that all the EDD students passed their qualifying exams because six out of seven of the EDD students took quals last fall. I'm happy to report that all six of them passed their quals. Not only that, but all six of them passed their quals without revisions. That has never happened before. Um, uh, maybe a miracle of some kind. It was worth a toast. We all toasted. We had glasses of wine and and soda and orange juice and tea or whatever we had. People had beer, whatever. We toasted to everybody a couple of times last semester because everyone passed quals and everyone finished some degree in their proposal. One student got her proposal in a late because she took an incomplete, got it into me two days ago, and I graded it on Sunday. So they all they all got through. They all passed now officially. Um, I hope you don't have to take an incomplete. Uh, I probably shouldn't even mention that it's possible because, you know, you should get done within 15 weeks. And here uh, in the final week, we'll have you share what you've done so far. And we'll bring back our guest speakers from tonight, our guest guests, not really speaking, but our guests from tonight. Uh, uh, Therese and Jennifer. Therese is one who defended her dissertation in early November, I believe it was. Uh, she flew up from Granada or Grenada or how do you say it, Therese? It's Grenada. Grenada. Her and Nick, her husband Nicholas came up and we watched the World Series game before she defended. And um, I made sure she toasted before she defended because I knew she was going to pass. It was a very, it was an excellent dissertation on blended learning and faculty development in, in terms of online learning across her campus. So she passed uh, EDD in early November. That's just two months ago. And Jennifer Park passed her PhD 11 months ago in February, I believe it was. It could have been January, but I think it was February. Is that right, Jennifer? Yes, it was uh, February 7th, um, I think. Yeah. Seven. And what else happened in terms of her dissertation? She won an award, everyone. She won ISPI, Outstanding Dissertation Award, the International Society of Performance Improvement. In the past, the IST department had many students who were majoring in human performance technology corporate training. We no longer have faculty whose expertise is in that area. We have faculty who have done things in the area. And some of us have worked with the military, including Dr. Brush, Dr. Kazuski, and myself. Um, but that's not our focus necessarily. In the past, we had more so. So we had many more dissertations on HPT and HRD related. 
Um, so I was really happy to see that we still uh, nurtured someone with those interests and was able to not just get a get done dissertation, but get a high quality dissertation. And she collected her data in Korea, uh, Heijong, uh, looking at some large corporate settings in Korea. Uh, and so in a second, I'll have Jennifer describe her dissertation. I'll have Therese describe it better than I have. But I want to just give you some backgrounds in terms of this course. What we'll do tonight is I'll tell you a little bit about this class. And then we'll switch over to Jennifer and Charisse. And I don't know if they have anything prepared or they're just going to talk. Is that right? Are you going to are you going to have any slides with us tonight? Charisse, yes. Okay. And Jennifer? One slide. That's fine. So we will we'll go to them um, probably in about 15 minutes. And then we'll come back to me and go through a little bit of the syllabus. And I'm going to end tonight with tips on defending your dissertation or on writing your dissertation. I'm going to have 10 parts of writing tips. As Yua knows, she took the class last semester. I started last semester with either part nine or part 10, the very end of my workshop on writing, which is focused on dissertating and, and having quality um, dissertations and, and how to defend. And so I'll figure that out, which part I'll do, part nine or 10 after break. Um, but I'm going to show you after break the syllabus, the Dropbox, the Canvas website, so you can see the course structure a bit, and so you can know learn how to navigate it. And really, the Dropbox, as well as the Canvas site, whatever is there, is there only as a resource. There is not one single thing you have to read in this class this semester. There are plenty of things you can read, okay? It's a difference between have to and can. Um, and there are, you know, a few associated books that are available for you um, to go through. Um, and some of these are up in Dropbox and you don't have to buy these. And one is called The Craft of Research. And this one, I think, has over 700,000 copies sold. I think two of the authors on here have actually died since they wrote the first version of it like 40 years ago, and two other people have taken over the books. There's four or five authors on this by Wayne Booth and other, at all, other people. Um, let's see, this, I think it's Teachers College Press, but maybe I'm, no, it can't be Teachers College Press. It is the University of Chicago Press, very prestigious. Um, this is some someone recommended, it's kind of the base, basic of doing research, I would say, I recommend this book. And I would say, oh, you got it, okay. Who's who's making you buy it? Is Dr. G making you all buy it or who? Okay. No, I already bought this in Korea before I joined IU. <laughs> At Korea University, she was, Jennifer. And Jennifer, uh, to, what university in Korea were you at? Iwa? So we've got two of the best Korean universities here represented. And Carrie, who made you buy the book? I think is when I took the class 7-Eleven with Dr. G. Dr. G, okay. Yeah. I was, I was wondering who was recommending it. <laughs> uh, another one I'm going to recommend is Trina Paulus's book and Jennifer uh, Jessica Lester, who you, some of you may have classes with Jessica Lester, their book on digital tools for qualitative research. Now. Trina Paulus, I think was a double major in IST and LCLE, language ed, uh, but maybe it was a language ed major and an IST minor, but she was in both departments and she was a former student of mine. She was at the University of Georgia for a while. This book made her so popular that the University of Georgia just gave her full professor. She was an associate professor at University of Tennessee. Georgia interviewed her and she didn't have to put any of her materials up or anything. This book was, was this and two other books she's done on qualitative research, got her famous. Um, but she moved back to Tennessee at a smaller university because her husband is in Tennessee. So she left Georgia and is back in Tennessee. I contacted Trina to possibly be a guest in this class this semester. And she cannot because she's a Fulbright person in Poland this semester. And the time would be, would be like five in the morning or three in the morning there in Poland. So, um, but before I contacted her, I contacted her co-author 
She didn't know this. I contacted Alyssa Wise. Alyssa Wise said yes. Alyssa Wise is an NYU professor now. She was at Simon Fraser in Canada for a bit. She's an IST alum as well. She started in IST, actually, maybe got a master's and moved to learning sciences. So she's a learning science PhD. She'll come in and talk about qualitative methods. She's going to talk about learning analytics, and she's going to talk about big data and digital tools for qualitative research. Her area is learning analytics, um, a big area. And she's become, she's actually got a grant right now in with the medical school at NYU for like $60 million or something, maybe more, maybe a hundred million. I mean, it's huge amounts of money. She's, she's brought in lots of grants and lots of things. She's a wonderful person. I think you all, and her middle name is Friend. She's Alyssa Friend Wise. So you'll, she'll be your friend at the end of the semester. We have three people coming in who are methodologists. One repeat from last semester, we're gonna have Dr. Hitchcock, who used to be an IST professor. He's gonna come in and talk about mixed methods design. Now, actually, what we did with Dr. Hitchcock last semester is we had an ask, his middle name is John, ask John anything. It's called an AMA, ask me anything session. These ask me anything sessions become really popular. And so we had an AMA with him and he answered all the student uh, questions. And he has a new book on mixed methods design. So we had talked about a bit about that too and about the field of mixed methods. So we'll hear from those two methodologists. I'm trying to think in my head, who's the third methodologist that I have coming in? I'll have to even, I'll have to look at who I've got on here to see who it is. A mystery guest, a mystery guest. Maybe it's me, um, I hope not. Um, hope we have someone better than me. So Alyssa's gonna come in on January 31st. So you, uh, you don't wanna miss that one. That's the end of this month. So you is gonna come once, I think once, we're gonna have Adam Mills come again as he came last semester, I'm gonna have Adam do something different. Adam Mills from the human subjects department, the ARB people at I IU. And what I'm gonna have Adam do, he, he usually does, presents these slides, explains IRB process. And you have to learn this stuff anyways when you take the IRB, so it's it's kind of redundant. So I told him to hit the highlights and we'll have mainly a Q&A with him and, and you can ask him your IRB questions. What are your what are the things that you need to know about? So we're going to approach that a little differently this semester. Um, we will have my former advisee, Merve Bastigan, come in and talk about 10 tips for literature review and forming research questions on March 7th. Do Dr. Hitchcock's going to be on March 21st, right after spring break. We will have, uh, I'm trying to, who's the other method? Maybe we'll have two methodologists coming in uh, this semester. That seems kind of odd, but anyways, I'll let me look back here if there's anyone else I want to point out. Oh, we're going to have an interesting time because we're going to have you uh, and two other people who started in the ISD program in 2010 as master's students, and now they're all either working on their doctorates or have completed their doctorates, all three. They all came from China, and now um, they're all finishing. One has already finished. Um, so I have Shuya Zhu, Yua Ma, and Bong Wan Zhao, Zhao. Uh, oh, Vanessa Denon. So my colleague from a long time, the person I have presented with the most in, in terms of e-learning is her, her name is Vanessa Denon. She's at Florida State. She's kind of an endowed chair now. She's moving up the totem pole. Um, she's become pretty well known. She's particularly in social media, e-learning, yeah, I'm trying to think of what are other things you might, e-learning, blended learning, social presence, um, social media, uh, men, and many other things. So Vanessa will come to us uh, and talk about systematic reviews of the research. I think it's real important for people to understand meta-analyses and systematic reviews of the research, even if you're not planning to do one, you should at least understand the logic about them because you're going to read studies uh, that um, do a meta-analysis or a scoping review or systematic review. Vanessa and I have done two special issues of journals of ETRND and of now online learning journal. It's coming out in two uh, months on systematic reviews of the research on online learning. The first one we did is systematic reviews of the research in emerging technologies. So Vanessa is going to talk a bit about doing a systematic review. Florence Martin came in the past two times 
and did a presentation that was quite lovely on systematic reviews. It's, she's very good. It's very well done. However, I don't like to ask the same person to come more than once, and I already had her come twice, so I don't want to hit her up three times in a row. So I'm 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 not asking her, at least not yet. If you all would like me to ask her, I would, but um, for now, I'm going to avoid that. We have also Charan Wong, who graduated a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago now, uh, from Language Ed with a minor in IST. Give us ten tips on presenting and, and defending a dissertation and communicating with your advisor. That's on March 28th. Well, we'll hear from a husband and wife, Dabe Lee and Yul Ha from Kennesaw State. They work with Tiffany Roman and with a couple of the people at Kennesaw State in Atlanta. Uh, they will present their writing tips to us on April 4th. Uh, and then my colleague, Maina Ju, will come back April 11th and talk about early career stuff. She's been very productive. Her first four years, she had 40 journal articles. 40 journal articles in the first three and a half years, like over 10 a year. She's just, it's just amazing. So we'll talk to her at Wayne State. Those are some of the guests that I have listed in here. I'm trying to look if there's anyone else I want to pull out and mention. Um, Therese, let me throw this over to you um, and see if there's anything that I missed. Um, I think you covered everything in terms of qual dates, though. Do we have those dates? What's the process for quals yeah, for yeah. EDD students? Are good we covering point. that today? Yeah, good point. Sue May found mistakes in the syllabus. So here's an apology. that The syllabus will probably go through seven iterations over the next three weeks. There will be typos. There will be wrong dates. My hard disk may have crashed. My computer is at Best Buy. I just went there an hour ago after I got done running and I thought I was told it was fixed. It's not fixed. I was planning to make final changes. I did get the syllabus done on Christmas Eve. I sent it to all of you, but I didn't do a final run through. Um, so I will try to change the dates using my laptop tonight and send you a new version tonight or tomorrow. So there are some, it has last fall's dates in there. That's an apology that can be easily fixed. Um, I will say, so there are a couple of assignments early that are due in week one and two. Um, one's a plagiarism test. Or if you took a plagiarism test, just give me a paragraph or two about what you learned from it. And the, the, I forget what the second item that's due early on. Um, it's not because I like things due early. I hate things that are due early. I really do. Because we, we've just spent this winter semester. We just graded papers. We did our annual report. We summarized everything we've done. We created new. So it's, it's been exhausting. I, you know, I hadn't have a day off. I haven't had a day off since December 2nd, 2019. So I'm wearing a shirt called Slacker. I don't think I'm a slacker. But um, <laughs> anyways, I have a suit and tie underneath this. But for now, I'm wearing my socks. So today was my 1,025th day in a row of running. And I've made um, calendars of my adventure of running, a 365 calendar of Indiana, Southern Indiana, with quotes from Southern Indiana. It's got thoughts on leadership. Thoughts on leadership, learning, and life. I did two of these things, one of Indiana nature and one of my dog in Indiana with different philosophical quotes. So I've been running every day. I've been taking pictures most days. I've been doing all this kind of stuff. Um, but I've also been publishing a lot. And because of that, I've come up with some tips on writing for all of you that I'm going to share with you to help you become a more professional writer. So I don't have the typical goals of this class that most faculty have. Most faculty have a goal of making sure your dissertation is, you know, quality and um, is, is doable and all that stuff. That's not goal. That could be goal number one. But I don't. I want to do at least two goals, maybe three goals. So I also want. I want the EDD students to pass their quals. <laughs> okay, that's another goal. And I want you all to be on the road becoming better writers. I could say professional writers, but that might be putting a stress on you. So I'll just say better writers. My goal is to make you all better writers and maybe better readers in the process. 
because you cannot be a better writer unless you read a lot, unless you know how to summarize, synthesize, um, pull out gaps, figure out the gaps. I want you to become identifiers of where you could, where research possibilities might exist for all of you, or where you could make a difference in your in your local environment in, in terms of strategic planning or some evaluation studies or really some primary kinds of research that you might be able to do. I also would like to have you think about how you might not do any of your research in the future by yourself, but how you might network with other people and form bridges across um, your departments or across institutions, because that's where real significant things start to happen. And that's where sometimes more personal fulfilling aspects of becoming a researcher happens. The solitary by yourself kinds of research that you're required to do for a dissertation is not what you should be doing your entire life. In fact, when I co-dissertated, I, I, my dissertation involved creating a keystroke mapping program in Word Perfect, kind of like Word, and then a, and then a, a prompting computer prompting program in it to foster generative creative thinking and critical thinking. And my colleague and I, Tom Reynolds, he studied college students, I studied middle school students. The same prompting system, the same keystroke mapping, the same theoretical perspective. I developed the model of writing, the theoretical framework. He developed the tools and we worked together. I've had three students work on communities of practice and they thought they couldn't share information with each other. So they all did their community of practice studies or virtual community studies by themselves. And I had to keep telling them, you know, you can share the reference, your reference list with each other. They're like guarding it, like no one else can see it until they're done with their dissertation. And so I want to break you a bit. One of my goals is to get you involved in sharing with each other what you're working on, share um, books uh, that you found, articles that you found, and so forth. Now, we could create a thread in Canvas for doing that. And last night's class, I taught 511, they asked me to create a thread so they could share some blogging tools and they're gonna do a blog. So that's a good idea. So if you have suggestions for me that things I might put in Canvas and so forth, we can do that. Right now, the only things you'll really find in Canvas is announcements, the syllabus, and the assignments, you can turn them in in a Dropbox. Oh, that's what Teresa's point on. Please, in the next week or two, those first two assignments that are coming due, don't do them in, as a PDF. Please do them as a Word document. Please do as a Word document. So then I can, because I cannot print right now, I don't have a desktop right now, I can only mark them on the screen. And it's easier for me to mark a Word document than a PDF. I know you can mark up PDFs, but it's much easier for me to do a Word. So if you can, when you submit the first couple of things, please submit in Word. Um, um, soon me, have I forgotten anything? No, I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions before we go to Therese and Jennifer so far? So let me count. Barbara, Carrie, Chris, Hejong. We have four out of the eight people. Is that right? Who are in this class? Am I missing somebody? There seem to be more people on the screen listed here um, than what I see. So I have there are 10 people. Okay. Um, who else is in this? Let me go through the attendance uh, in here. Jacob. I don't think Jacob's here. Paula. Um, uh, Tofik. Is that how you say it? Tofik? Am I saying it right? Tofik. Tofik. Yeah. Uh, those three and i think there's another person there should be eight in here but chris herrera yeah i know chris so um last semester we had almost everybody come every week even though these are optional we cannot require you coming to synchronous meetings especially the online students the the face-to-face -face we can the residential we can but the online we cannot because we advertise that way but i'll encourage you chris is here where's chris there you are. You, I just don't see you. Okay. So before we switch it over to, um, I think I'll go switch it to Jennifer first, and then I'll go to Therese. Um, before we do that, just real quickly, can you tell us your name and uh, what's your topic that you're interested in 
for your dissertation and where you're from. So Tina. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Because this is first time I'm using these headphones to actually speak. Um, so what's my topic and what I'm interested in? I was asking, somebody asked me about bread over here. So they kind of interrupted you. Um, so um, what I'm interested in is uh, STEM careers, like how people get interested in STEM careers and uh, what, what makes them persist through, you know, elementary all the way to getting that STEM career and then maybe even persisting in that STEM field. Um, okay, that's enough. That's enough because we're going to hear you okay. all. We're going to hear you okay, for 15 okay. weeks. Um, and, and we'll get back. We'll, um, sorry to cut you off. So Tina was a guest speaker last semester and did a, a presentation on the makerspace in Greene County that's out there, a part of the Korean Naval Warfare Center. Um, I might have that wrong, but Korean. Uh, Heijong? Or is it Heijong or Haijong? Heijong. Heijong, yeah. Hello, my name is Heijong. I'm from South Korea, and my research interests are computer science education and artificial, artificial intelligence education. Very good. Yeah. I just started a study on chat GPT, and we'll be looking at that in terms of language learning. So I'm interested in AI. I've been interested in AI before I went to grad school. I was going to study AI, actually. I never did. Um, Chris. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Herrera. I'm out here in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the US. And um, I currently work for um, a financial institution that's global. So we have 70,000 employees across the world. Um, uh, my research interest is uh, informal and formal learning in the workplace and the impact it makes on employees. Um, what that impact is, is something I'm not, not too sure on uh, the, the certain area, but really happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here, and um, it's great I had you last semester. Carrie. Uh, hi, my name is Carrie Fong. I'm originally from China. I I work in Hong Kong for nine years, and then I'm here. Uh, my research interest is in computer-supported collaborative learning and how teachers can facilitate, can support that. Nice I, want, I just got thinking, I wonder if we might invite your mother to come do a presentation in this class about her research. You know, I can be, try. Yeah, it'd be <laughs> like 12, it'd be like eight in the morning in Korea or in, in China, in Beijing, or it'd be actually six, in the morning, maybe at the end of class when we had, you know, maybe it'd be closer to eight in here at night, it'd be eight o'clock there. So we don't wake her up too early, but maybe she come in for maybe a half hour and give us and talk to us about the research that she's doing. She's like a center director and she was a dean for a while in charge, right? Uh, yeah, she she was. And she, I think she is now. Uh, I can try, but but only if it can benefits all the all the class. That's that's the reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk. OK. Yeah. Um, Barbara. So I am a clinical assistant professor at the South Bend campus of IU and program director for the Bachelors of Science in Medical Laboratory Science. So I am planning to do a program evaluation with a curriculum focus. I've seen your name before then maybe at South Bend. I don't know where. I don't know. <laughs> I try to stay under the radar. <laughs> okay. All right. Who's your advisor? Uh, Dr. Glazewski. Okay. And Carrie, who's your advisor? It's Chris, that's it, yeah. To a two for Dr. G. Uh, Chris, who's your advisor? Dr. Kwan. Dr. Kwan. Hey, Zhang. Dr. Prosh. Prosh. And Tina? Dr. Leftwich. Leftwich. And you are, you're Dr. Brushes, right? Right, and I'm on, yes. And I'm on your committee as well. And Therese was with me, and Sunmi was with me, and Jennifer was with me, so, okay. So Jennifer, you want to tell people a little bit about your dissertation and about what kind of the, the road that they're going to go down within this class, because you've took this class, I think, 
uh, and what they can expect to get from it. And, and she'll be speaking more from a PhD, but really for any doctoral student and Therese will represent EED students. We have a half and half here. Sure, um, let me set up my slides so if you and can- Jennifer is now a assistant professor at UNC Wilmington in her second semester as a tenure track faculty member. Dr. Uh, Bonk, I think I know where you've seen my name. It just hit me. You recently did some uh, talks about Mosaic. I'm a Mosaic fellow. Oh, that's where I saw or, it. Uh, yeah. Senior fellow. That's probably yeah, where yeah. you saw it. So yeah. I remember I wanted to talk to you about that. <laughs> yep, yep. And I've had students do papers on Mosaic and I've, you know, and a dissertation actually on the badging system there. But can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay, hey, um, so I'll just briefly go over my study and in the, and while I explain my dissertation study, I'll um, kind of briefly introduce what you should be mindful when you take this course and while you prepare for your dissertation. Um, so hello everyone, good evening. Um, I'm Jen Park. I defended my dissertation um, on actually February 9th of 2022, and I just can't believe that it's been almost a year since I defended. Um, my dissertation uh, was entitled The Relationships Among Sustainable Work Environment, Human Agency, Openness to Change, and Innovative Work Behavior. And I'm currently a tenure track assistant professor of instructional technology at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, so I started my PhD um, in 2017 um, and um, went through rigorous coursework in the ISD program for three years. Um, I minored in um, organizational behavior and human resource management at the Kelly School of Business and also inquiry methodology uh, within the School of Education. Um, I did my dossier two um, in January of 2020, and I took um, R795, the course that you're currently taking, in the fall of 2020. Um, and then I defended um, about a year after that, um, and then it was a really fast uh, process. But it took it did take me a year to um, you know, write my proposal. Um, and then after everything was settled, um, it was, you know, it was really fast. And then I completed my manuscript at the end of 2021 and defended on the first week of February in 2022. And part of the speed of the process was having a quantitative dissertation as opposed to qualitative in her case. Yes, so if you, as you can see here, my um, dissertation was a quantitative study. Um, it was guided by uh, one main research question. Um, and I looked into the structural relationships among each constructs uh, described um, in the diagram. Um, so I won't go into detail because uh, my topic is kind of, you know, it's everybody's topic is different. Um, here, I just wanted to bring, um, um, introduce this slide because I want you to all think about the feasibility of your study. So I was thinking of doing, oops, I was thinking of doing a um, SEM study um, using structural equation modeling, um, and I needed at least 150 uh, participants in order to run that analysis. And you need to identify whether you have access to that data and whether you are, you know, you're like confident that you will be able to collect the data. Um, so I collected data from five uh, companies, but initially when I did my proposal defense, I told my uh, committee members that I will collect from one company. Um, and then um, while I was collecting data, I realized that 
I was only getting 100 or 120 ish, um, and I couldn't, you know, reach the saturation point. So I communicated with my committee members whether I can expand, um, you know, um, the scope of my study and collect data from more than one company, uh, which fits the the criteria of my uh, my study. Um, and they agreed. Um, so I ended up collecting data from five large conglomerates in Korea um, that were um, all going through uh, the process of delayering, um, trying to flatten the hierarchical corporate culture. Um, the methods here, the methods that I've used was um, CFA, descriptive statistics, correlation analysis, and SCM. And um, I think I prepared myself to do a quantitative study while I was doing a PhD minor in inquiry methodology. I took almost all quantitative courses that was offered um, in the methodology department. And um, it was in fact my first quantitative study like ever um, um, in, for my dossier study or my master's thesis was um, qualitative and case studies. Um, and this was my first, um, you know, big, large data quantitative study. And I really took advantage of the opportunity to do so in my, um, for my dissertation. Um, so if you are thinking of using a certain uh, data analysis for your research, um, I would highly recommend you to like study the methods um, and and to move out of your comfort zone, because if you only do a interview study, you will only be able to do an interview study um, and you just have to. Um, to be versatile in the research topic you select um, and. Um, you research methods really matters. So um, that is my story. So Jennifer, a couple of things I, I wanna ask and we'll open up. We have a jam board. You've got the link there in the chat. Um, I have three questions for you to, to, before we go to student questions. Number one, can you tell them a little bit about the snowball effect in your data collection and the fact that you actually had an insider who is giving you assistance. Um, the, the reason I, po I pose that question is because often the, your study, studies will hinge on access to data, uh, access to participants. Once you have access to participants, it's, you know, it's a green light. But in your case, you had some yellow lights flashing in front of you uh, early on in the process and almost a red light. So you wanna tell them how you overcame the flashing red and yellow lights um, yeah, so I had an insider within company A uh, that was like the primary organization that I was targeting. Um, she was a HR person and she um, actually the study started based on uh, an informal conversation with her because um, and she agreed to, you know, distribute the survey and um, a Qualtrics link to her colleagues um, and also encourage other people to, you know, in, within the organization to um, to to participate in the survey. But it was difficult to reach that point because at the end of the year, um, like I, I distributed um, the survey like in the month of October ish. And at the end of the year, most companies in Korea go through like their annual you know, evaluation stuff, and they're like really busy. Um, so although it was a super large company with like, I don't know how, like a lot of employees, I was only able to reach, get responses from like 120. Um, so I reached out to uh, other contacts, like my friends, um, my other, you know, colleagues that I worked with before, um, and then um, asked them to distribute. And that was a really good strategy. And, um, and it, it worked uh, pretty well. I think I'm maybe mistaken yours is the, with a different study. Weren't you able to figure out like which of the employees had a LinkedIn account were able to post the survey within LinkedIn somehow. Um, this other people might want to use that strategy. So yeah. Um, what you did. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one approach was um, contacting my close contacts and ask them to distribute. Um, and the second way, because I was desperate, I reached out to people on LinkedIn. Um, and so I like personally messaged them. I got, I paid for like the, like the premium LinkedIn where I can like message everyone. And then I told them my situation and really like asked them uh, for their support. Um, I reached out to many, but I can't really tell how many responses I've gotten just from LinkedIn. Um, but I, but um, there was a, there was a question within my survey um, asking like the company that they're working for, because it has to be within the five companies that I've selected. Um, so yeah, I think that was the other approach. And then, um, so just don't rely on one person. That was, uh, the lesson that I've learned because, um, they are willing to help, but they cannot guarantee that, it, that they'll get you like 300 responses for you. So, and so the reason I raised that some of you may rely on Facebook or on you know, other social media to get your population to fill it out. LinkedIn is probably one of the more professional places that you can go to. Um, sometimes you can rely on organizations, such as if you're a member of AERA or AECT, they sometimes will, AECT in particular, will send out your survey requests to their, their member lists. You know, that works sometimes. It's not going to work every time, and it's probably got a, a limitation of volunteerism. So you have to also be concerned with that. I've been able to collect names off of lists. So I've done MOOC studies and I've I've gone to, you know, we've collected thousands of MOOC instructor names off of listservs and, and other listings of MOOCs. I was doing research on different open access platforms where people were sharing contents. They have memberships online. You can go and you know, data mine those membership lists for emails of people and so forth. There are ways to get names in different ways. I've bought, as Jennifer did, she paid for a subscription in LinkedIn. The, what, a 50 bucks or 100 bucks or 200 bucks? What did it cost, Jennifer? Do you remember? I got the first month pre free uh, trial and I collected data within one month. So I didn't really pay. Oh, you but didn't really pay. Yeah, but I use like, you know, the premium version. Yeah. Okay. So you're getting all the sneaky, you know, so we'll, we'll share the sneaky stuff. But I've actually paid thousands of dollars for names, emails, names, and so forth to, to send out as a distribution. There are agencies which you can contact that have data listings. Uh, sometimes it costs, you know, a, a thousand, two thousand or more. Um, and sometimes you have budgets. So in IST, we have what's called a Kemp grant. You can write a proposal to have some data, you know, get some funding that way uh, and so forth. Second question before we go to student questions is, since this is your first statistic, this is your first quantitative study, did IU provide support for doing your quantitative study? And if so, who would our students, who would, these, who would they contact and what was your experience like? Um, where did I get methodology support? Is that yeah. was um, so I so so I took um, the SC, SCM course um, like very rigorous from from Leslie, um, and it really helped me to um, to to gain interest in the methods, and it was a great fit for the scope of my study. So that's why I adapted it. Um, so the course has really helped. And then I kind of, um, I needed to freshen up that methodology because during a semester long course, you get deeper into the theory rather than like the tech, like the tech, tech like technical parts. So I uh, took a free um, like a um, lecture online, which was like two, two hours. And that really freshened up and it really went through like the statistical tools, which I kind of, you know, I, I needed to freshen up. So that really helped. And I also got help from um, the IU methodology consulting um, office or consulting service. It's um, housed um, within the School of Ed. 
and they are graduate students offering free help. Um, and there is a quantitative um, graduate assistant and a qualitative graduate assistant. So if you can find the contact, you put it in the chat for everyone. Um, yeah. Leslie Rakowski doesn't teach that structural equation modeling for online. So the EDD students, I think, I don't think she teaches that because it wouldn't get enough of an audience, I think. It's a face-to-face -face class. But you can find classes like it going to uh, Coursera or Udemy. Structural equation modeling has become very popular, but it's kind of complicated. And you need a minimum sample of like 300 people, Jennifer, something like that? Uh, mine oh. was minimum 200. That's recommended um, from the, the literature. Okay. So you, you can check and see if you can find the, the names. And my last question before we open it up, can you share with everyone some of your findings to, and where you plan to publish it? So they're, you know, they can understand, you know, where you're going with this. Yeah, um, so I just provided the link, um, research help. It's free for students. Um, they provide Zoom sessions. So that's the probably the most important thing all semester. We can we can close the class now. That's all you need. <laughs> Everyone can go home. We'll see you in 15 weeks. <laughs> yeah, so I actually met with her for like four four sessions. And she really helped me with data analysis. Um, but be aware, um, we are we are instructional technologists and not methodologists. They take a more theoretical, in-depth approach, um, and that is like easily okay in our field. But as a methodologist, they can't really neglect it and say it's okay um, because they study that like really in depth. So I kind of filtered some of um, her comments because if I follow her uh, all of her advice, um, it would have been a methodology logically really you know sound and perfect dissertation but it was not the scope that I am I was able to do um so I don't know if you understand what I'm saying it's better for qual qualitative but quantitative it's it gets like there are a lot of like small pieces that you need to make sure that you know it's valid and you know and all that um so yeah, that's just a small, sh uh, short reflection. Um, my my study results were um, came out very good. Um, I think it was because um, the the data size was was large. Um, it came out that um, the predictor for my study uh, in my model was how sustainable work environments support. Um, employees agentic behavior and how that um, mediates um, employees openness to change and innovative work behavior and it has all shown positive relationship among these constructs um, so um, most quantitative researchers really hope to get um, you know, like the pause, um, the 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 strong relationship among the constructs that they are examining, and I was very lucky and got that. If it was all not positive, and did not, um, it would have been okay for a dissertation, but it may not have been, um, you know, like publishable because that's not really. You know, it means that you didn't do a good job in your literature review and search um, and background research because your your model is is developed from the literature and what previous literature has has said and researched. So um, I plan to publish. Um, um, I'm going to split it into three pieces and hope to, um, and that's going to be this semester's, uh, my, this semester's primary goal for me to just um, get it out there and publish it before it um, gets outdated. Where are you publishing this? Um, Trying. 
I'd like to publish it, um, my, the primary piece, the empirical piece um, at uh, the Human Resource Development Quarterly. Right, good place. So two things. One, what she was studying is the flattening of the hierarchies in a corporate setting to create more collegial atmosphere so it's not so top down in nature. And so there's more freedom and more opportunity for innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship within the organization. So it's not all top down directed. We're all automatons working underneath someone who's you know, got a higher rank than us. I mean, that's kind of the pervasive thing underlying this, which is not just important to Korea as a culture, but it's a worldwide phenomenon that's happening. So her dissertation has global ramifications. Uh, and that's why I want to make sure she writes this up. The second thing I want to point out is that the no significant differences effect, which all graduate students worry about, especially if they do quantitative studies, which was the case when I defended my dissertation way back in the day, everyone's worried about no significant difference. Well, if you have no significant differences, you can still pass your dissertation. You don't have to sweat every night that you're going to have significance or not. You just report the data that you got. You hope to have significant things to talk about. Or sometimes if you have not significant things that are opposite, that's just as important because it shows that the theory might be wrong or the, the, the what previous studies might be mistaken or that the culture has changed since the last time a study has been done in this particular area. So having don't not verifying your hypotheses or your uh, findings to match your research questions, having the opposite effects of what you had hoped for is okay. Don't stress, you just have to do a study, analyze it in a sol solid way, write coherent prose, and then come up with insightful things to say about your dissertation. That's the hard part. Some insightful, engaging things you want to say when you defend your dissertation. Don't be blah, blah, blah. This is what I found about, this is what I found. No, you tell us, make it, make it a conversation about you, you know, who you are as a researcher, what you came to and what you studied, and here are some of my insightful conclusions. And the last two pages, especially the last page, you can stand on a soapbox and say whatever you want. Don't end your, don't end your dissertation with your limitations. You don't want your parents, your brothers and sisters, your maybe you have children down the road, grandchildren. What you don't want them reading a dissertation that was your best document of all time and end it with this negative. I have all these all these limitations. What a downer! After working so hard for a year or two years and to end with all the problems. No, you end with the problems. You you, you have the problems. Then you have your future directions and some other conclusions and some big lofty statements where you here's what the field needs to do. You can say you at the very end for the last period, this is what the field needs to do, you know, because you've you've read the research, you know what it says. And now's the time for you to make a statement because so you've done a study. So anyways, I've this is stuff I'll harp on during the next 15 weeks in here. Um, do we have other questions for Jennifer? I just like to add one thing. Um, I think it's um, when you design your study, always think about implications for research and practice. Um, and that's what matters. They don't care like how well your literature, like they meaning your committee members, they don't care whether how rigorous your literature review is. Obviously it would be with some rigor because you, you've uh, that's that's the feedback that they give you when you do your proposal defense um, but the final defense of your dissertation is going to be the latter part um, post data collection and what matters is whether you know your thing like and you really care about the topic and you think this is an important study and your study proves or gives you know a message or implications that it is going to contribute to the field of instructional technology, human resource development, performance technology, whichever your field is. And then it will not only inform the researcher, but also the practitioners. And it will be useful um, for people um, in the field um, to make a difference. So I really um, just wanted to mention that. Do we have other questions? I don't see any in the jam board, but we'll open it up for anyone who wants to post something. I have one one question. Um, so more, I guess, more along the lines of clarification of 
like an EDD student dissertation versus a PhD, um, and and what that what that might look like. Just some maybe some similarities as well. I think um, um, based on my experience within the IST program and currently as a faculty um, for. EDD pro, um, dissertations, I think um, the committee is looking for something that will help your workplace that will kind of not like really um, like groundbreaking stuff, although PhD dissertations don't really do groundbreaking stuff as well. Um, but um, but something that will benefit your organization um, and and for PhDs, it would be more um, like a like a first study, like a study that you would like to continue in the future um, in your research career kind of study. Um, Dr. Bonk can collab um, elaborate on that. So an EDD dissertation might be more scripted in terms of the the scope, uh, might be more localized. Uh, you're looking at making an impact within your particular work setting. And um, a PhD might be looking at the more towards the global impact and, you know, looking at the psychology of human beings and the changes from, you know, different instructional approaches that might impact the human species as a whole, as opposed to impacting the boys, cl boys clubs or girls clubs or boys scouts and girls scouts, you know, more localized kind of nature to the study. So you know, uh, I, I would say that that would be one way to think about it. Um, Thank we'll you. Yeah, we'll probably get that question repeatedly or during the semester, and we'll have different ways to answer that. Maybe that's not the best answer in the world, but it's one answer, because <laughs> Therese keeps laughing at it, so I'm sure she has a better one. Um, but Sunme had a question I saw before we go to Therese. Sunme? Yeah. Actually, but you know, actually my internet is not stable, but I can try. Okay. Thank you for your great presentation. I really enjoyed your you know, presentation. And then just, I have one question. So what is the most challenging part of performing your dissertation? Actually, you know, your slide shows that it went really quickly that I expected. That's because I think the usually PhD part is more intensive and difficult, but you, you know, went through really quickly just to one year, I think. So I'm just curious. And then how to, you know, overcome that difficulty. So can you share <laughs> your experience? Sure. I think it was, um, as uh, Dr. Bonk mentioned, because it was a quantitative study for a quantitative study using um, like a larger data set, um, you have to do a lot of groundwork. And that's why I, it took a lot of time for me, um, like over about a year um, from 795, it took me a year to draft my proposal. Um, so the literature review part took a long time. Um, I changed, so my 795 topic is different from my, um, my dissertation topic. And my prospectus is different from my dissertation topic. So your topic kind of slightly changes over time. Um, um, I did use part of my 795 final paper in my dissertation, but it it was only a small part of it, um, and the project became a little bit bigger. Um, and then um, after I did my proposal defense, it was really fast because I had everything set up. I if I send the Qualtrics link to my friend, like she was going to distribute that day, so I did the groundwork was longer. So after I did my proposal defense. Um, in September or October, September of 2020, 2021, it only took me like four months till I got everything done. Um, and just one side note is, was I kind of got a job offer at that point. So I really like 
I only slept four hours to really get it done. <laughs> so I was doing data analysis, like, I don't know, like for, for a week, I, I was doing data analysis. I was writing the data analysis in like four days. I was writing the discussion part one week. And then and then I sent it to Dr. Bonk. And then he would get back to me like, you know, like really fast within like three days. And then I did it, you know, I elaborated the parts and and it was so it depends on the person. I'm I was a full-time PhD student, so I was only working on my um my um dissertation at that time so and i was in korea um living at my mom's place so i didn't cook i did nothing i just took a shower and then like as soon as i woke up like 6 a.m i started and then and then so and oh and one more thing so I had, I, the environment was good. I was able to just work on my dissertation. So that was one of the factors. And I don't, people that, I'm not saying it's bad or good, but some people perform well when they take time. And the, that leads to quality work as well. But it doesn't mean that even if you took a shorter time to complete something, it doesn't mean that, um, it's lesser quality. Um, so it's it really depends on whether you want you can concentrate within the short amount of time and whether you've got every pieces like put together and ready to go versus you like taking your time, you spend time with your family, you go out on Fridays and like you do all that and then do it. I had nothing. So um, that really made my health deteriorate. So I do not recommend that strategy. Um, take a little bit more time. Like if I took like six months more, because many of my um, cohort colleagues, you know, defended in the summer uh, when I defended in February, first week of February. So if I took a little more time, you know, but but I don't regret my decision because I started doing um, my job interviews, um, like I defended on February 9th and I did my first job interview the next day, February 10th. And that became, you know, my current job. That job was, is my current job. So it kind of worked out. Um, so yeah, I think it depends on the person, yeah. the timeline and whether if you're working full time, it's not going to happen. So um, I have the same story that Jen had. I had a job offer at West Virginia. And I also had a son coming from Korea and was selling a house. I had, had everything happening uh, all at once. I was collecting data, analyzing data. My whole, my my doctorate, my master's took me two years. My doctorate, all coursework and my dissertation took me less than a year and a half, counting coursework, okay? So I thank the 15 doctors that inspected various parts of my body that got me through my dissertation in the acknowledgement section. I had bursitis in my shoulders, my knees. I had to swim a mile a day at lunch to make the stress go down. And the stress would go down for six hours and then it would come back up. You know, the adoption process is not easy. Um, and plus you add collecting data, interviewing for jobs, uh, analyzing data, all this stuff all at once. It's, it, it's a very stressful situation. So we don't recommend it, but it can be done. Uh, and, um, you know, it, you, I should have taken more time, you know, another six months would have been healthy for me, much healthier. So, you know, don't, don't look with envy on people who are finishing early. You're going to have better health by taking a little more time and, you know, uh, and so forth and a better relationships with family and friends and other things. So, but it can be done. It can be done if you, if you focus. Yeah, to add one more thing, like you need to have a very good um, committee chair that is willing to, that is like really, really willing to support you, whether it's a crazy timeline or not, <laughs> whether you have, co you have COVID or not, you, you're traveling or not, you know, like whatever his you know, personal plans are like willing to like review your paper, like at 2am, like that it's, 
you have to be really lucky to 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 meet that person and it will change um like your doctoral career it's whether make you go crazy or like make your life really easy so it's um um and you have the opportunity to choose your dissertation chair and all of your committee members um so you've you make the choice so um just do the research on 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 the people on your committee and um and uh, and see if they are um supporting your research yeah and one person's reputation might be good in one situation not good in another you know i mean um you might not be a good match for certain people so you you know your advisor you may have heard good things or bad things about them it don't over don't over generalize in the field of academia just don't over generalize there are so many factors to consider uh in the process we probably need to go to Therese because we need to get to a break and I'm sorry Therese we've held you out so long do you have I, I I don't want you going through your entire dissertation with us what did you what did you bring with with you I just brought 10 slides okay, with quick good. trips and lessons yeah. learned. Okay, that sounds perfect. Okay, and then after that, we'll go to break and we'll come back. I'll go through the syllabus a bit with all of you. All righty. Are you seeing my slides? Yes, we do. Okay, so good night, everyone. It's great <laughs> to meet you all. I am Sharice Mahabia Cletus, and I am here to share some tips to help you not just survive our 795, but to also thrive during this entire dissertation process. And before we get started, I just wanna tell you a little bit about myself and also the program that I did and my study and all of that. So first of all, I'm a Caribbean girl. That's what I tell myself. I was born and raised in an island called Trinidad, a small island in the Caribbean. And then I moved to an even smaller island called Grenada, also known as the Spice of Isle. And throughout my entire career, I've always worked in academia and I've held many positions from being a coach to an educator to a consultant. I am currently the instructional designer and an assistant professor at St. George's University. I am right now spearheading a project to redesign the School of Veterinary Medicine's curriculum using a flipped classroom approach. And I've actually been at IU since 2010. I also started my master's in 2010, and then I moved on to the EDD program in 2016. As Dr. Bong mentioned, I graduated just in December and I defended in November, November 2nd, I believe. Um, and my topic was faculty attitudes towards inclusivity in a blended learning environment. And this was a mixed method study. This was my first mixed method study that I did. And I had a really tight timeline to complete because like Dr. Park mentioned, she was also going for a new position. I also was transitioning to a new position at work as well. And it was actually a mandate. It was a requirement to get the position that I needed to complete my, my doctoral studies. So my research interests are along the lines of integrating technology to support student learning, inclusive learning, blended learning, faculty development along those lines. I'm also very much interested in each PT. So if you want to collaborate on projects, feel free to reach out to me. I would also I would be really happy to help you along or to collaborate on any research projects that you would have. So here are some quick tips of lessons that I learned and things that I would have wanted to know or mistakes that I made along the way that I hope that you don't make the same mistakes. So First off, when thinking about your topic and deciding on your topic, start with the broad topic. All of you, I, I was making notes as you were all speaking about the topics that you are interested in. But now it's to sort of hone in on that and really think about what are the specific areas within that broad topic that I want to focus on. 
and then think about what what are some of the gaps or challenges in these areas, especially for the EDD students, because it's more practical and more practical application within your your institution or organization. You want to think about what are some of the gaps or challenges that need to be explored further. What helped me as well was going back to some of the assignments and readings from past courses, looking at those readings and seeing, okay, are there areas here that will spark further exploration? Are there areas here that I can implement within my work setting? I also had lots of discussions with colleagues, especially since I was doing my study within St. George's University, my organization. I spoke to the gatekeepers, the people at the top, because I wanted to get buy-in from them from the get-go. So I brainstorm with them. I brainstorm with, with people that the topic would impact and also outside of 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 my institution I looked at experts in the field I Dr. Bonk was my advisor and I was really grateful for all of the advice of pointing me in the right direction so for example I knew what I wanted to do was inclusive inclusive learning and I was looking for an instrument to use to measure the faculty attitudes. And Dr. Bonk, I told him, I was like, here's, here's what I'm doing, but I need to find an instrument. This is what I found already, but it's not get towards higher education. Uh, do you know of any? And then he put me on to another EDD, a past EDD student who had, a, uh, who had an advisee who did something similar. So, you know, reaching out to your network is important. And if you have two or more ideas, I had like, I, I wanted to save the world and I wanted to do everything under the sun. It's, it's about really putting down those ideas on paper and looking at what are the pros and cons? What is feasible? What is practical? What will make the most impact? What am I passionate about? And then deciding on which one should I go with? And then make sure that it's achievable within the, your time frame. And within the particular location, whether what what local research site are you using? Is it practical to do within that site? You know, what are the red tape? What's the red tape that you're going to face with it? With that, when I crafted my initial research questions and I sent it to Dr. Bong, he told me he's like, you've got about five dissertations here. Oh. <laughs> you need to you need to cut it down. And in my mind, I thought but I want to do all of these and I want to do all of these great things. But then when I actually got into it, I saw the value of cutting it down because doing a mixed method, it's like doing two dissertations in one. And I saw the value and I was like, man, I should have just done two questions instead of three. So those are some things to think about when you're thinking about your topic. Make sure it's realistic. It doesn't need to be perfect. You can always go back and build on it later on. Save those other research questions to put a different spin for articles and publications later on. So moving on, in terms of writing. Think about your audience. This was something that echoed in my mind from Dr. Bonk and my entire committee throughout this process. Think about who your audience is. What is your main, what are your main research questions? Why should they care about this topic? Why is it important? How are you going to manage your time to complete this project? Those were some of the questions that they asked me. And it was important as well when I'm writing, Dr. Bonk mentioned it earlier about coherency, making it concise and clear and making sure that you explain all of the terms, especially if you're not in a USB setting or you're doing your study in a setting outside of the US, you want to make sure that you explain all of the terms so that it's, it's, everybody can understand it. Where did I start? I started with a brain dump of my ideas on a Google Doc. And then I organized those ideas into sections. And then I refined those ideas into key sentences. And those key sentences were what I fleshed out to make my paragraphs. 
because some people, it's very difficult for you to start. So where do you start? Brain dump all of your ideas onto a Google Doc and then organize them. Okay, this goes with the rational. This goes with the methodology or the problem statement. So just start with placeholders and start putting things into your Google Doc. And then what I did was I tackled some of the straightforward sections that were easy to write. I tackled those first and I knocked them out because that gave me a sense of accomplishment to keep going. And, you know, think about proofreading. Think about um, this is not set in stone. It can be revised. Dr. Bonk also told me, make sure that you elaborate on your story. So keep telling your story. Make sure that you, you're passionate about the topic and that shines through in your proposal. And make sure that it's convincing. So it's a piece that's persuasive and convincing and you can establish the attention of the reader for your writing. In terms of organization, things can go haywire pretty quickly. So it's about how do you keep up with all of the articles that you have and keeping everything organized and the different versions. There were multiple versions of final, 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 final of documents. So I strongly suggest creating folders to keep everything, organizing things into folders, coming up with a naming convention for your drafts. So am I just going to do it final version one? Am I going to do it by date? Am I going to use both? How am I going to do it? Color coding also helped me. I'm on a Mac. So I color coded my documents in my folders to what were the important documents? What were the things that were related to um, research methods, the ones that I was really using, ones that were, all right, I put those in yellow. So I had some sort of color coding system going as well. For referencing, some people use citation managers. I did it the old school way of just using a Google Doc and I put the references into a Google Doc. So I had all of the references in a Google Doc and I just pulled from there and cross-reference. Some people use citation managers such as EndNote and those worked really well for them. I started with it, but I couldn't keep up. So I just did the old school way. I also, for my literature review, I use smart tables and I will post the attachments of the tables that I've used previously. And that helped to keep track of who's the author, what were the main ideas, this was quantitative, this was qualitative. So I can pull those back easily as needed. I also did set goals and timelines. So for example, Last year, this time, I was preparing for my dissertation defense. I did R795 in fall of 2021. And then in January, I defended, the end of January, actually January 31st, I defended my proposal. And then I gave myself the whole of, uh, until May to collect my data because I was working with a semester schedule. So I gave myself a month between defense by the end of February to have my IRB done. I had, for, for my proposal, I had all my survey instruments and everything created already. So a lot of the groundwork was done. And I then wanted to send out the survey in March. But because I didn't anticipate some of the red tape of getting things approved at my institution, it took a lot longer. So my survey didn't go out till May. And I only had like about two to three weeks to collect data. So I still managed to collect the data by June. It pushed me a little bit behind schedule, but I was able to make up the analysis in June and July and have a draft ready for Dr. Bonk in September. And then I made whatever changes. I used September to do whatever edits we had to do and have it ready by October to send off to schedule the final defense. So basically, I took about 10 months after dissertation defense, dissertation proposal defense to actually finish. 
So it was a really tight timeline. In between there, I started a new job in October as well at my institution. So there was a lot going on in addition to working full time, juggling a family and all of that. So it's important that you set goals and try to keep up with it as much as possible. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. The other thing that really helped was keeping a notebook because ideas come when I'm in the grocery, standing up in the line, late at night, sometimes things just keep popping into your head. Keep a notebook or put notes on your phone and then transfer it to your notebook so that you can come back to these ideas. These ideas later on, you will realize when you start writing your last two chapters, especially chapter chapter four and five, these things come back. So please keep a notebook. That was super helpful. That was some advice that was given to me as well. In terms of tools that I used. So when I started this process, I was using Google Docs. My account was still in Google Docs, my email. So I started in Google Docs, but then I moved, I had to move everything over to Office 365 because of I use switch to Office 365. And I continued with my shared documents, drafting everything there, but also keeping backups on my laptop, keeping backups on my external drive so that I have everything. When it came to software for SPSS, uh, for quantitative, I used SPSS. And that I used IUWARES, IU Anywheres SPSS version. However, what happened was that when it came to my analysis, which I was doing over the summer, I wasn't a registered student. I didn't register. I had no courses to do. So I didn't have access to SPSS or Envivo, which is what I was planning to use initially. So if it is that you are planning to use these tools, but you're not, and you're going to be doing your analysis in a term that you're not going to be registered, make sure that you download the software beforehand and have it installed. Because then it costed me to pay for another qualitative tool to use. And I used at last TI, this was one I had taken qualitative with Dr. Lester, and she had recommended I, uh, at last TI, and that was one that I used for qualitative. It's There are some differences. It's probably not as powerful as NVivo, but it did the job that I needed it to do. For transcription, I used Otter AI. They have an educational version, and it was $30.95 per month, and I used it just for the period that I needed to transcribe, which was just a month. And then citations, some people used EndNote. As I said, I started with it, but I didn't complete, I, I didn't finish using it. <laughs> it just got too complicated for me. So these were tools that I used along the way that were really helpful. I definitely, and most of y'all will fall into the procrastination trap at some point. And there's a lot of anxiety around quals and your defense as well. But what I've found is that setting realistic goals and keeping a to-do list really helped me to stay on track. Planning when to do my reading and writing gave me some structure in the midst of all of the chaos with work and personal life. And this is dependent on person, right? Some people are good with just doing it at the 99th hour, but when you're juggling so many things, it was really helpful to have some structure of, okay, I write on Saturday mornings really early, or I get up early in the morning and I write before I go into the office and I do my readings on an afternoon kind of thing. I also found that having a colleague who had gone through the process was really helpful. They were my source of motivation and they also served as my accountability person. So each week she was actually my walking buddy as well. So while we walked, she'd be like, okay, so what are your goals for the week? And then she would check in with me to make sure that I, I, I was keeping on track with those goals. Throughout my life, I always needed to study in silence. However, once I hit that proposal writing prep stage, I was having a lot of trouble focusing and someone suggested instrumental music. 
And that was a game changer for me. So don't knock it till you try it kind of thing. Just Google YouTube instrumental music. That really helped me to focus also changing location. So sometimes I would be in the office or I'd be in my home office. I live on an island. So I would go to the beach and I would do my readings and writing and stuff like that. And that helped as well. They say attitude is 80% and skill effort is 20%. So keeping your goals at the forefront, believing in yourself, it could get really dark and you can feel really demotivated very easily if you don't have a good support system around you and you don't have that positive mindset. So even those reading those positive affirmations and Dr. Bong's inspirational quotes from his little book and his calendar really helped me to keep that positive mindset and to keep going. And don't forget to take deep breaths. Take it one small piece at a time. So you don't have to write the whole thing in one week. If I if I would have planned better, I wouldn't have been as stressed as Dr. Bong said, as Dr. Park said, you know, give yourself enough time or else you're going to spend it in doctor's bills. And then in terms of self-care, it's really important that you celebrate the small stuff chapter by chapter, section by section, make sure that you're taking breaks, let your mind breathe, because that's when the ideas flow. And you come back with a fresh pair of eyes, you're able to pick up a lot of the errors, because sometimes you're staring at the screen so long that you don't see some of the errors. We also underestimate the importance of sleep, diet and exercise. But I really try to get, the, uh, it didn't happen all the time, but try as best as possible to get at least seven hours of sleep, including exercise, eating healthy, because it made the world of a difference when I did do it to how I was able to focus on the stamina that I needed and also setting boundaries. So having those conversations with your loved ones, doing things that you like at least once per quarter, you know, if you like going to the spa, go to the spa, do something for yourself because you're also juggling everything and we tend to be our hardest critics in this whole process. In terms of quals prep, this is a semester where you're juggling quals prep, you're juggling all if you're doing other courses as well and you're also trying to write this proposal. So what really helped me was practice. They say practice makes perfect. And you'll be surprised how fast three and a half hours goes when you're, when you're writing those quals essays. So to set yourself up for success, try taking some mock exams. Um, when I took quals, I took it with Dr. O, and she actually had a mock exam online for us to take. And it was time. So we actually sat and took it like if we were taking the real exam. And I would suggest that you do that. I did the two mock exams that she had. And she, I realized that my timing, I was really off with my timing. I didn't finish. I didn't finish any of the mock exams. So I knew that I needed to figure out ways to be more time efficient. And with that, I decided to set up proposal templates. So for quals, you are going to have a needs, it could be either a needs assessment question or an evaluation question. And it has to be a polished document. So I set up my cover page in advance. I set up all of the different areas of what your needs assessment should look like, what your, 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 program evaluation should look like, your timeline, timeline, your rationale, all of these things in there. So that when it came to the actual exam, I was able to just pull up the template and tweak and fill in the sections. I didn't know what the question would be, but a needs assessment template is standard, a program evaluation template is standard. What helped for the article critique was actually reading the last year of tech trends. Every single article in the last year of tech trends I read. It helped for two reasons. It prepared me for calls, but it also helped me to see were there any gaps for my proposal? 
I was on top of the I felt on top of the research. So reading the last year of Tech Trends, those articles, and actually critiquing some of those articles helped me to improve on the timing for the exam. So those are some things that I, I found really helpful. Gather all of your research methods, resources. So go back to our 500, I'm sorry, Y500, Y611, R711, R690, and pull some of those resources. Our 5 to 1 and 6 to 1 as well, we would have had needs assessments, resources, and program evaluation. Pull some of those articles, pull some of the textbooks so that you have your bank of resources there and actually start a reference list. So it's easy to copy and paste. You don't have to worry about APA citations and all of that so that you have all of that ready to go to pop into your template for your quals exam. And then what I did was try to use my committee question to knock off chapter two, which is the literature review. So I knew what my topic was and I knew where I was going with it. So I crafted the, the committee questions so that I could have been able to answer my literature review, do my literature review. And that also saved a lot of time. So by the end of R795, I actually had a, a good draft, a solid draft to send to Dr. Bonk to give me feedback. And I, I did that because I did it in fall. He gave me feedback in December. By January, I had the changes ready to go to send to the committee to schedule the proposal defense. So these are some strategies for quals prep. And then in terms of the proposal defense, I can't underscore the importance of rehearsing and practicing. So practice as much as you can rehearse so that you can make sure that you get it down to the 15 minute time frame. Use this as the opportunity to practice for your final defense. So you want to dress professionally, walk with paper, a notebook to jot down your questions and comments, and make sure that you reiterate all of those changes back to the committee so that everybody's on the same page, you haven't misinterpreted anything, then schedule a meeting with your advisor to go through, okay, which of these changes do I really need to make? Which of these things I don't really need to focus on too much right now and then revise a new plan. For me, I did my study at my institution, but I was also a student at IU. So I had to do IRB twice. IU zone was pretty simple. It took me about a month and a half to get IRB approval at my institution when I thought it would have taken me like two weeks. So cater sufficient time for IRB approval and any other institutional approvals that you may have to do. So for example, after IRB approval, that's when I found out that I needed to do another survey approval at my institution, which I didn't cater for. So putting in some buffer time would really help with your sanity as well. And that in itself is a back and forth process. So be prepared for that. And also don't forget to send thank you reminders, send reminders to your committee before the defense as well, just to remind them to make sure that they show up and they've read your proposal and come prepared. And I think that's it for me. Remember, I think if I had to leave you with one piece of advice, I would say aim for progress and not perfection. There will always be changes. You will always want to make changes to it. So aim for progress. Just keep going. You have got this. And if you have any questions, my email is here. I'm free to answer any questions to guide you to be your sounding board if you need to. I would be happy to help. Thank you, Therese. It was wonderful. I, you covered ground that I wasn't thinking you could possibly get to in the first week, but you did. So thank you. Um, as I said, we we uh, 
we front loaded a little bit in here. We're covering some things that we'll get back to in weeks 13, 14, and 15. So we will we will we will touch these again. But I want to reemphasize a couple of things. One is that Jen Park, Dr. Park, and Therese, uh, Dr. Therese will be back in week 15 to give you feedback on your status and your proposals. You'll be presenting them and they'll they'll be giving you some feedback on on what they think you should be doing. And I'll be giving you feedback on your ideas all semester. So you'll get many experts. It won't, it won't just be you solitary, but at times you'll be working alone. At times you'll be talking to us. The second thing that Therese mentioned was being straight, the straightforward the sections, the things you can knock out. Sometimes you get stuck on methodology. Sometimes you get stuck on data analysis. You could, you could always go to the end and write your limitations up because you know what those are. And that's an easy one to knock out and write up in maybe an hour or two hours or three hours. You've got the limitations done. You feel really good about yourself. And that helps build the momentum for something else. Or you can write the future directions. You can actually write the future directions before you ever study, do your dissertation. You don't have to do this sequentially. You can always work backwards and then fill in the gaps later on and write the transitions later on. Transitions are not hard. You just have to remember to do them, you know. So you can do the, the ending, not, not necessarily the conclusions <laughs> before you collect the data, but you can write some of that, you know, some of that. Um, a couple other things. Um, you should revise your dissertation at least seven times. I just threw that out there. <laughs> but I think every document you want to feel proud of, you should be looking at at least seven times and you should have at least two, ex two friends or colleagues or experts look at your document as well. Uh, color coding, that helps many people. Therese talked about color coding everything. For many people, that's very, very useful. Um, I, I think the goals and timelines is extremely valuable. You should think about timeline, flexible timelines and changing those timelines. Don't, don't kill yourself over making every date in the timeline. Just have a flexible timeline and, and have goals. Humans are goal-driven creatures. Once you put the goal up there, you'll strive to meet those goals and you'll, you'll stop making popcorn and eating popcorn and going to get another candy bar or dilly bar. I go at night, I get a dilly bar or, you know, whatever, but I try and eat healthy all day until the night comes in. Uh, <laughs> um, notebooks. I didn't, I had a sheet of paper. I had sheets of paper, but like a notebooks. And so every time I read an article that said there's a gap in the research or the research should be addressing this, or no one's looked at this yet. I wrote down the name of the article, the page number, and what the gap was. And by the time it came time to do my dissertation, there were 69 ideas for doing a dissertation. I, I, had, I had a sheet of paper, maybe five sheets of paper. I wrote all the gaps and all the articles I read during graduate school, and I had it in my closet. I didn't look at it every day. If I pulled it out of the closet, I looked at it. Oh, here's another gap. I write it down. And I, I had 68 ideas for a dissertation. I went with number 49, which was a combination of two different ideas. So you, you know, just writing things down, goals, timelines, ideas, and so forth. Now, Therese's idea of a templates, Therese might have to share those templates with us so that my students can, can use your templates. So after class, maybe you can share them and I'll put them in Dropbox, Therese. I just put them in the chat. <laughs> oh, you did, okay. So uh, also send them to me an email, that might be helpful too. Um, instrumental music helps me too. I listen to soft uh, classical or new age music always. Um, and that, you know, or nothing, or nothing, you know, nothing with words. Or I, or I get Chinese music that's, I can't understand the words. Um, so they are Korean music, uh, female voices typically. I love listening to it. I don't know what they're saying, but it sounds good. To-do lists are very, very important. And I have, you know, always in my pockets, different listings, um, different notes that I, I gather. In fact, I have all my students who are dissertating and all the ones that have finished. Teresa's on the list here. Jennifer's on the list here. Sunmei's on the middle list because she's not done yet. Um, so Yua is almost on the list. She's writing her proposal, I think. Oh, yeah, she's actually on the list. So right there, Yua. So, you know, I keep track and I look at the list of every day and about once a week, I go through the list and I write emails to people on this list and say, how's it going and what's, what's going on. A positive mindset, Cherie said, that's extremely important. 
um, uh, Maina Jew will come on week 13 or 14 and talk with us, think week 13. I call her P-squared. She's positive and productive. You have to have a positive mindset. You have to, you know, if, to survive in this world in the higher, in, in, in academic space anyhow. Um, you don't want to be negative. There's too much negativity in the world already. You don't want to add to that um, and try to stay positive. You're going through hoops and hurdles. These are things set up. It's like basketball. Okay? Doing dissertations like basketball. Some days you throw them up and everything's going into the hoop and other days they don't go anywhere near. They're bouncing out. So, you know, just keep shooting. Just keep shooting. Eventually you get the points that you need. You know, perseverance matters. Revising papers. When you, I had my 400th publication during break. That's, I had nothing my first five years as a faculty member, not, basically nothing. I just went to conference, conference, to conference. I didn't know that you needed to persevere and finish the papers. I just like writing papers and I present them and I go to the next conference. I write another paper. My, a lot of my best stuff's never been published. Just, I didn't know you needed to publish them. So persevere, respond to the editors and um, in a positive way and you can get a lot of things done. To-do lists help, goals help, instrumental music help, positive mindset, all that. Um, Qual's practice. For EDD students, I have not yet put the Qual's practice in Canvas. So soon may after class, we'll talk about this. It requires me to do something technical to move the files from one Canvas course to another. But once they're set up, it works lickety split. It works great. So it has a timer that's built in to take the Qual's. Just It simulates taking the Qual's experience. So you will get the feel what it's like to take a three hour quality, three and a half, whatever, it will time you. So, and there are practice ones in there for both day one and day two. Um, and then there are committee questions that you have to respond to. You're gonna have to create a committee question this semester if you're taking, again, raise your hand if you're taking quals. I don't know if Chris is taking quals or not. Uh, Barbara is, okay, Tina is. Chris, are you taking quals? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, oh, and Hojong, you're not taking quals, are you? I'm taking for exam this month. Dossier two. So yeah. PhD dossier two. Uh, different kind of quals, but hard. Both are, hard, you know, actually, I like my personal is I prefer the EDD quals. I think PhD quals are too hard. Um, sorry, <laughs> but um, I think they're too stressful. I think EDD quals, you just study, you take them for a couple of days and you get done. I, I, I think it's much more efficient. It maybe is, maybe it treats people too much like old school behavioral model, but it works, I think, most of the time. Um, but EDD, PhD quals are a good learning experience. So um, they're, they're, they're valuable. They help you throughout your life. They're just, yeah, different. It's different. Um, so uh, we have to, so the other thing is I tend to give feedback on assignments within a week or 10 days and everything except quals practice. If you take the quals practice, it often happens during the semester when I'm at a conference or so. The last two semesters, it's the quals practice that I've had a real difficult time giving feedback on for EDD students. So I'm making an apology in week one. I may give you feedback right away. Some people, if they get them in and certain, so you can take them anytime you want. And the due date for them is after the quals. Actually, I don't require you to take the quals practice until after quals are done. You might think that's silly, but I don't want to stress people out. So some people don't take them until April. And that's in the middle of conference season uh, for me. If you take them in January or February, I can get you feedback right away. So I'm just pointing that out. Uh, if you're looking for feedback on quals, students are really stressing, EDD students really stress about getting quals feedback. And I'm very bad at getting quals feedback. I'm very good at getting other feedbacks. <laughs> I'll try and be better on quals feedback, but everyone passed quals. Everyone passed quals with no revisions. So my feedback doesn't matter. Just do them. <laughs> Practice matters more than my feedback, but I'll try to get you feedback. Um, we need to go to break, but do we have any questions for Therese or Jennifer? Jennifer, you're looking like you want to unmute your, your mic. Did you want to say something and respond to anything? No. Okay, you are. Um. I have a question for Dr. Therese. Um, sharing your timeline really helped me because I'm very similar like your timeline right now. Um, your presentation is very motivational to me because I'm right now I feel like I'm stuck. I was like, 
you know, after the break, I feel like I don't want to do anything, but now we're back to um, work and then back to the, the proposal. Um, question regarding the ARB and your proposal, which one do you complete them at the same time or you complete your IRB first or proposal first? I completed my proposal first, defended it, and then did my IRB because things could change. For example, my title of my, my, my dissertation changed after my defense. So I, I had like the, the forms drafted, but I didn't submit it until after your defense and you made all of the changes and all of that. I'll I answer see. that differently. The faculty in some dissertation defenses, some of my faculty colleagues really like having you have the IRB done before our proposal meeting. But it depends on who it is. There's no consistency, I can say on that. I will say that if you do the IRB before the dissertation proposal defense, it's helpful and you can always change it with minor changes. If you feel confident in it, number one, and if it's a complex dissertation, you probably want to submit it early if it's kind of complex and it's going to take a while to get approval. So if you think you're, because if you, and if you need to collect data fast, like Jen needed to get her data fast, you want to have that proposal done and, and, and approved. I think Jennifer, you had your proposal approved or before your defense, right? I actually, didn't have an approved IRB proposal, but it was, I submitted it and I provided the the protocol, whatever, all the documents that I submitted to IRB um, and, and put it in my proposal paper so that my committee members can give me feedback on it. Right. Um, and it was like an easy fix, but there was nothing to fix at that point. But some of my one, I think one, some of my committee members had questions about my instrument and stuff like that. So um, I think it is recommended you have um, your IRB approved yeah, before sure. your proposal defense or at least submitted. 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 I'd say the norm is to have them submitted about 25% of them or 30% are approved before the defense. About another 30, 40% are at least submitted and about 25% are not approved or submitted before the defense. And Sharice falls in that latter category, mm -hmm. but it's all over the board. Um, if you have a year to spend doing a dissertation, yeah. If your committee is kind of flexible and just, oh, okay, don't worry about it. But if you, you know, um, have a more strict, yeah timeline you want to you want to be on top of it um Sunne, did you have your dissertation proposal submitted before your defense your IRB yes. submitted yeah okay. yeah before that's Was because a, you know at the time i couldn't you know schedule the you know defense for proposal that's yeah. because everyone was really busy during the summer so yeah. anyway i submit the irb first and then I got it approved before. That yeah. brings up one more thing. Some faculty will not serve on dissertations proposal, will not do work during the summer. Um, and that means July, uh, June and July. They're gone. Yeah, They're right. out of country, out of mind. Right. Some faculty who refused to in the past now do. I see them doing it. So it's, again, no one <laughs> rule. Uh, I, I had seven or eight dissertation proposal meetings. I had six of them in the summer last year. If I had said no, I would have been going crazy the last fall because I'd had six proposals in the fall, plus the others, normal ones in the fall. So I just had a lot of students going through. There's no way I could say no. I had, I've been on, I was on 13 dissertations in 2022 completed and eight more proposals. That's proposals or dissertation defenses. I was on 21 of them last year. That's more than I've ever been on before. It's too many. <laughs> and so if I had said no to July, June and July, I would have been going crazy in, in August, September, and October. I mean, um, so some faculty refuse. Just be aware of that. So, you know, I can tell you who will not if you ask me privately. Um, so other questions for Therese? 
we've gone long tonight here. We're two hours already. I don't know how much I want to talk when we come back from break, but I'll give it a shot, give you some writing tips. But first, I'm going to go through the syllabus a little bit, not long. I'm going to show you the websites, not long. I'll probably be five minutes of showing you those websites and Dropbox and everything. I'll probably give about 10 minutes of writing tips when we come back. If you don't want to come back after break, it's okay. I understand. I'll just be recording it. Um, but I'm going to go through part nine of my 10 parts of writing tips, part nine relating to dissertation, um, I think. I just looked a little bit at my notes. I, so we should thank Jennifer, uh, Dr. Park, and uh, Dr. Therese. Um, and for their for coming in, not going to the beach tonight. Both of them live near beaches. Jennifer is on the beach in North Carolina and Wilmington, and Therese is on, on Granada. Um, so, you know, we need to go visit them. We need that invite here. But let's give them a round of applause, a big thank you. And um, I'm going to actually just hit the pause button if I can get this resume. Part two in the same recording. I'll show you a little bit, but I, I had two other books sitting here um, I just didn't mention. Conducting Qualitative Research on Learning in Online Spaces by Hannah Gerber and colleagues. Conducting Qualitative Research of Learning in Online Spaces. So if you're conducting research on learning in online spaces, it might be an interesting book if you're you know, an e-learning person like me. Another book, third edition, How to Do Your Research Project, A Guide for Students by Gary Thomas. How to Do Your Research Project. This one's pretty good. It says the take line is um, stuck. Get Oh, no, it's, no, it's not the take line. Um, so this book is from British Live. No, that's not the publisher. I'm trying to see who the publisher is. Maybe don't list one. Sage. So Sage. Sage has got a lot of these books. I think that one's a Sage book. I think Jessica Lester and Trina Paulus' book is a Sage book. Sage has cornered the market on research books, inquiry books. So my friend Florence Martin, who spoke last semester and the time before I taught this course, she presented on systematic reviews the research. She's writing a book on systematic reviews with Sage as a publisher. I, I connected to her actually. So this book on how to do your research project has a chapter on literature reviews, a chapter on deciding on research questions, a chapter on methodology decisions. Oh, and another one, on, a chapter on gathering data, on writing up your conclusions, on analyzing data, you know, how to communicate your findings, how to synthesize what you found, how to code how to do group focus, focus groups, how to interview, just basics, really is, you know, so I, it's, some, it's a book that you kind of, it's thick, so you might not read it on a plane, but it just, it might be a good guide to have, it's like APA manual, this, that might be a good guide, again, it's, it's Gary Thomas, and so, and I brought some of my books, I mean, the, this year I've had three books they're all teaching related. So um, Mena Ju and I published Transformative Teaching Around the World, which is really stories of teachers who took our class on the Saturday class that Carrie had with me um, from 22 countries. And um, it was kind of fun, mostly Fulbrighters at IU. Dr. Pawan and I, and another former student, um, Shaojin Ko, wrote this book on engaging online language learners, a practical guide. I didn't do a lot, but they're using my tech variety model in it. So I have a book called Te Adding Tech Variety that's free. You can all download this now. It's on how to motivate and engage online students. It came out in 2014. It's been downloaded probably more than 300,000 times. It's got a new version, a shortened version that came out in September. I can send to you, but you can just go to my homepage and get it. It has a free class on how to motivate and a free book. Um, the publisher is the Commonwealth of Learning in Canada. So those are three books that came out this year. And then I have a, this is a 100 activities book. I have a sister book called R2D2, Empowering Online Learning with my Read, Reflect, Display, and Do model from Josie Bass. I'm kind of most known for the World is Open book. It's been translated to Chinese and Arabic. It's bestseller and sold more in China than US. Let's put it that way. So 
This is about how the world's become open for learning. It's based on Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. And then more recently, I have three books on MOOCs and open education, this one in the global south. So I'm kind of known for that. So just as an introduction, I didn't introduce myself. I taught a class in 1998. And I think the last minute of the class, the 15th week, I introduced myself. So I didn't want to wait till week 15 to introduce myself. So I'm a former accountant, as many of you know. I'm a former educational psychologist. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I think I'm still an, an educational psychologist, but I'm in IST because the learning science people took over ed psych back in 2003 and four and five, and they didn't treat me well. So I left ed psych for IST. Um, there was bad things happening and some, I can say it now, some bad people moved from IST into learning sciences. Those people are gone now, but they didn't treat many people well. And there was a lot of fallout from that. A lot of bad things happened. And so I'm in IST for, this is my 18th year. It's hard to believe. This is my 34th year as a faculty member. That's hard to believe. Um, I've been teaching since I was eight years old. Um, kind of like I'm precocious, kind of like Therese, you know, <laughs> Therese is smiling. I see her picture up there. Um, so, so let me share my screen a little bit here. Let me show you. And, oh, I might have to, let me, let me do this first. Let me make sure that, um, I have my homepage up so I can ease with, with zoom sharing, you cannot find things oftentimes. I, I find, and um, unless I put my homepage up, there it is. So um, let me put this down here. So um, Jennifer Park put up this breathe thing. So you can go to a, 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 just breathe. <laughs> Talk about Sharice's um, comment about positive mindset and instrumental. There's a website just called Breathe In. So eliminate the stress, breathe in, breathe out. Let all the stress come out, breathe in, let the calm breathe in, all that. So you can find these pretty easily online if you go online. Um, what else do we want to go to here? No, 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 no. Okay. So Canvas, in Canvas, you will find announcements. Just one, probably at this point, syllabus. You'll find the assignments and it will tell you when the assignments are coming due. Um, so you can click on a particular assignment in there and it will tell you the explanation of the assignment. And it's due January 13th. So the plagiarism one, the first one is due January 13th. It's coming up quickly. It's not that I like things coming due fast, as I said. It's just we have to have a couple things done right away. Um, the other one is due January 17th. That's a statement of research goals. Most of these tasks are very short. There's only a paragraph or two or three. So most of the first four or five assignments in here are short, but they all get compacted together at the end into a, your proposal. So this is a building blocks, in effect, in here. And again, try to use Word and not PDF and try to upload them in, in, in Canvas, although I hate Canvas's um, Dropbox tool. It's not that good. It doesn't time date stamp. It's not that good. You, you will, we're not using the discussion forum, but we can, could. You will find today's class posted to Kaltura Media Files. You'll find the people in this class, including anyone sitting in on the class here. Um, we have a photo calendar. If you want me to pronounce your name better, there's a name coach. And so you can you can pronounce your name the way you want me to pronounce it using name coach for 10 seconds. And there's the grade book will be in here. I'll try and up the grade, update the grade book pretty quickly. It's in here with all of your names on it. So that's pretty much it for Canvas. Again, there's whole, not a whole lot we're using within Canvas, but some things. If we go within the syllabus itself, it has a link to Dropbox. And in Dropbox for this particular class, there are dissertation examples. So this is a strength, I think, of the Dropbox. It has dissertation examples. So you can see dissertation examples that are EDD dissertations, 
or PhD dissertations, and there are many of them in here. Erin Chris, she'll be a guest in this class later in, in this semester. She's wonderful. She was one of the, well, one of the first EDD graduates. Uh, Rob Elliott, who had no revisions, only two people have had no revisions. He defended after Jen Park about a week after him. My day, it was day 700, no, day 500 running, maybe it was, or no, 700, 700, the 700 club. So it was 325 days ago he defended. Um, he's at IUPUI as a professor there. So you see dissertation examples, you'll see um, this PhD examples as well. And I think I've made a Jews, Charan Wang who'll be a guest in this class, Shang-Yi Lin from Taiwan, Emily Hickson from Ke uh, Purdue Calumet, um, Jennifer Park, her dissertation's in here. So you'll see hers. Uh, Mena Ju, who I mentioned, Merve, who's a guest in this class later on, Raj, who studied micro-credentials. I just saw him in Austin, Texas. Susie Porn Sanjapanra from Bangkok. I, was, I haven't seen her in a little bit, but I'm talked to her recently. Uh, Yul Ha, who's a guest coming in this class, and Zi Hung Shao, micro credentials and badging. She's a guest next week. So Zi Hung will be a guest next week, along with um, Sun Mei. So you'll see dissertation examples, and you'll also see proposal examples. So if you want to see, so there's a difference between prospectus and proposals. There's EDD proposal examples, and, and, and you will be a guest in this class. She's great. She's up in Michigan doing teacher training stuff. She's been a guest many times. So you'll see proposal examples in here, both PhD and EDD. Um, Brian Beatty, who's well known for the high flex model of instruction. Um, some of you may know Renee Hong. She's now dissertating. Mena Ju, you might know. Um, so other ones are in here as well. And then there are prospectuses. So prospectus is a very short document, two pages typically, like an abstract of what you're going to do. Use prospectuses to convince people to serve on your committee. But And you also might have to submit the prospectus to the graduate studies office when you um, set up your defense state. I'll put the guest handouts so Therese might send me her handouts. I'll put those up in Dropbox. I'll put my handouts. So the G3 of writing is already up there, all nine parts and all 10 parts. If you download the first document, you can have the entire thing. If you just want to go to what I'm going to talk about tonight and next week, it's part nine and 10. So that's up there already in Dropbox. Um, quals examples. So for, for EDD students, um, oh, there are there's a committee question. So I have examples of committee questions, which you negotiate with your advisor. Basically, you submit a possible topic, and then your advisor makes it harder. No, the advisor makes it more clarity for EDD students. So day two of your quals for EDD is a committee question that you respond to in 4,000 words or less, including references, I think. Um, it might not be including references. It used to be 2,500 words, but that was too short. No one could say a whole lot in 2,500 words. So we've, I help negotiate the increase to 4,000 words. What else is in here? Uh, the weekly readings. And oh, it, you know, the syllabus should be in here. If it's not, I'll put it in there. Yep, the syllabus is in there. And then um, task examples. So if you want to see an example of plagiarism reflection, of task one, uh, research goals, of task two, research questions, of task three. So these are all in there. And actually these, I got permission from the authors to include their names. So we could contact them if, if they have questions. So I have permission to include those in here. If there's not enough examples, I have more from last semester. I can ask permission from the last semester students. Data analysis plan. Um, there's lots of those. Dissertation prospectus is in here. So uh, task five. So task five, the dissertation prospectus is probably mislabeled because it's more than a prospectus, 
but less than a proposal. It's somewhere like a prospectus proposal. <laughs> it's in between. And it will be probably be around 15 pages to 20 pages double spaced, or maybe 15, 10 to 15 single space. So you won't have your whole proposal, which tends to be 50 to 60 to 70. If you're in language ed, it can be a 140 page proposal. I've seen many. Um, you might be at about half that at the end of this class. So you won't have the whole proposal written, but you'll be on the way to writing the whole proposal in this class. And then task six, I want you to either reflect on the, the readings in this class and what you learned from your independent readings. Um, and there, there's also a task seven, which is an, a practice article critique. Um, and task seven, or so if you're if you're an EDD student, you could do the practice quals. If you're a PhD student, I want you to interview a former student for task seven. Okay, so there's there's examples of all that in there. Um, what else? Revision table. So revision table are examples of journal article revision tables. So I've written responses to the editor of what I revised in the paper. They're just examples of how my colleagues and I have responded to get something published. I never got that as advice as a grad student. No one ever told me about that. And that's why for five years, I had no idea I was supposed to publish things. <laughs> so, sort of serious, sort of true. And so I think looking at a revision table will help you become more um, perseverant in the face of difficulties. If you get rejected from a journal, I mean, Carrie and I are working on research right now. We're going to submit to a journal at some point. We'll get comments from the editors, or reviewers that we'll have to respond to. The revision table will help you respond. Okay. So there's just some examples in there. The main thing that I haven't shown you yet is the we weekly readings. So I have examples of each week, I mean, not examples, I have the readings for each week in here. So if you click on making research matter, you'll see Tom Reeves article on, you know, the research we have is not what we need or making research more rigorous, um, making research matter more by 11 other people. None of these you have to read. These are just in there because I think that they're interesting and important. Um, you know, to, to learn about. You might just skim some of these and download some of them. So some weeks might be more important to others, such as week four. Week four on educational design research or um, design-based research, DBR, EDR, whatever you want to call it, is very hot topic during the past 10 to 15 years. I've had Dr. Tom Reeves, an expert at design-based research or educational research design, come in here twice I um, uh, decided not to bother him this semester. So he's not coming. I'm getting Alyssa Wise in this semester, but you can go here and you will see Tom Reeves, I think, from the University of Georgia in his articles with Susan, Mc Susan McKinney and Reeves um, have published a couple of books on educational design research that are quite good. And then he has his 12 tips very good article, 12 Tips for Conducting Educational Research in Medical Education, but it's applicable to anyone. Um, I currently have an article in the medical field about to come out myself. So you can read some, if you want to read about qualitative methods, you want to read about case studies, here's articles about case studies, not that many. Uh, Yin is the big name there. Um, if you want to read about mixed methods, Dr. Hitchcock will talk to us about that. There are articles by Creswell, who's a good colleague and friend. Um, you might have bought Creswell's books from other, you know, the people have recommended Creswell, Creswell and Creswell, his husband and wife. Um, then weeks 12, 13, 14, 15, you notice it says just writing advice one, writing advice two, writing advice three, writing advice 2020, 2021, 2022. And then I have career advice. So I've put articles about writing advice, just tons of short, very short articles from the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, which has all the tips that I'm going to talk to you about. They're in there if you want to read more beyond the tips that I have. And we lost, Sunmi had lost her connection. Sunmi is coming back in here. Thank you, Sunmi. It's good to have Sunmi back. 
So you can go in here and find those particular articles um, on, on writing, but also on career. Let's look at the, well, let's look at the no, week 15 here once. So these are more new ones, eight motivational tips for writing dissertations, 10 ways to make sure your writing has uh, whatever, I don't know, crucial co-writing considerations, how to avoid failing your dissertation, um, how to write books, how to get started, how to jumpstart your writing process. Um, PhD students as entrepreneurs. That's an interesting article. I like that one. Rewarding your writing with tea or with chocolate or with ice cream bars, which I'll probably have after class here. What professors do during summer break. Um, I don't know what it, uh, writing a popular trade book. All these are, you know, are just recent things that have come out in the past couple of years. So let me go back here. And finally, I added week 16 last semester. I found students want career advice. So just three articles in career advice, how to write a syllabus when you become a faculty member. Um, if I only knew when I was a grad student, that's a good article, if I only knew. Uh, and so anyways, that's Dropbox for all of you if you wanted to explore um, Dropbox. Whoop, cancel that. Let me go back here. So you can go in and explore it. The other thing here is the syllabus itself. Now, if you can't find the syllabus, if you lost it, you go to my homepage and you scroll down. It's the last, second last thing here underneath my picture at the top. So you can click on that and it goes right to the syllabus. Okay. Um, I've got it called up here. And if you need the Dropbox link, it's right here at the top. If you want, um, the syllabus, well, this is the syllabus link. If you want to go to Canvas, if you forgot how to get to Canvas, the link is here to go to, back to Canvas. I could click that. It takes you right to Canvas, right? If you want to go to Dropbox, there, we click right, we go to, back to Dropbox again. So really easy to do that. Um, if you want to write an email to Sune, her email's at the top, my email's at the top. So everything's kind of at the top here except the link to Zoom. I think it says to be shared here at the top. You see that at the top, to be shared. It's down below if you lost the link. I just didn't want Zoom bombers in here, okay? So there's the objectives in this class and so forth. Oh, we'll have two or three weeks of consultation. That means one-to-one -one meetings with me. That means all eight of you will meet with me for about a half hour each on a particular day or a couple of days time. And soon they will join the ones that her schedule allows. So you'll get one-to-one -one feedback from myself and soon may at least twice during the semester. If you've got ideas for changing the syllabus or doing something different, I'm all ears. I'm, you know, um, and here's the Zoom link you see right here at the top. There's the Zoom link. Um, what else here? Oh, we have a Google Doc in here that we set up. Soon me and I set this up. So it has your names at the top here. Whoop. Looks like I lost. Come on. Come on. It's frozen. <laughs> Let me go back and try this again. It's the nice thing about the back button. Let me try this again. So if you could put in here your name, your advisor, your possible topic, where you were born, all that kind of stuff, that would be helpful. Places you want to live in the future, your hobbies, you know, we'll, we'll at least find something out about you, like we did about Barbara here and about Paula. So please try and fill that in during the coming week. Uh, Chris has done it as well. Tina's done it as well. Great, great. So you might want to take a look at, at that. Um, there is a grace period, and I'm not sure I change the grace period every time for every class. Um, so so I, we have a 72-hour grace period in here. I, I think that means three days. So three-day grace period. If things are due Tuesday night at midnight, they're really not due till Friday night at midnight, okay? So, and I think for final assignments, we may have a couple extra days, in fact, but we'll see. We usually... Towards the end of the semester, I try and give a couple extra days for final. So, but but task five, the big thing for this semester is do both April 11th 
and April 18th, either day. So it's already kind of a seven day grace period built in. Plus you have those three extra grace days, okay? And then the week after, you'll be presenting your proposals to everyone else. Your quals practice is due April 4th, although I think quals is before that. Does anyone know when EDD quals are this semester? They are March 30th and 31st. Yeah, that's right. I got it yep. in my plan. Yep, thank you. I had to put that in my syllabus and plan my class around it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, who was that who said something? Was it Barbara? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Barbara. Yeah, because I teach on Thursdays, so I'm going to have to... Had to fix that. So yeah. So you'll notice people the students last semester asked, well, you're Dr. Bonk, why do you have this do after quals? Well, it just I don't want to stress people out. And so it, you know, again, if you're a PhD student, you'll do an optional assignment, which is interviewing someone uh, who finished their PhD already. I think that's what the option is. So you'll see the schedule in here and you'll see task one or task, we call it task zero. You'll get two bonus points automatically for this. So if you do the task zero, everyone will have an A plus after the first week because you have two points out of zero points, <laughs> if that makes sense. And then um, we do have a, a task due next week at, at this time. Um, and that is your task one statement of research goals which isn't too difficult, actually, it shouldn't be, but it gets you to think, I think. So if you go through all those different weeks, I've kind of really covered all that, but qualitative methods, case methods, writing and crafting, those are the themes of the week. That doesn't mean that the person coming in will discuss that theme. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, so it's really, this is more kind of a combination of a course that's self-directed, it's one-to-one -one consulting and it's group like this. So it's kind of a three classes in one um, in here. And maybe it's a little more defined or rigorous or however you wanna say than you might've expected. I had an EDD student last semester who was surprised we meet every week. She was expecting just to do her dissertation and not come to these sessions. All the EDD students were very, very um, in, happy to have weekly meetings because they're stressed out over quals. So um, yeah, this explains task one, the introductions, Google Docs introduction, statement of goals. It just, those, there's a rubrics, I think, with some, of them, with some of the tasks in here, but most of them are just great on, you know, 20, 30 point, I'll be looking for, completeness, coherence, relevance, logic, that kind of stuff. So that just explains all the different tasks in here. With task six, you have three options. You can do a um, journal or a blog on your readings and write a two page summary reflection, single spaced on that or so that's a weekly blog on what you've done every you know week in this class, um, and then writing a paper on that, or just you know, uh, or you can do um, extensive reading on your own and just um, submitting a two to three page paper with thirty references, maybe relating to your dissertation and your topic, just reading more in depth in an area. Or number three is to design your own task six, whatever that might be. Um, and then task seven is either taking quals, interviewing a former student, or some student self-selection option. In interviewing a student, I want to put the, I have, the bars are on the screen. They're all over the place. Um, if you were, if you saw my screen and I have all this laid out, doesn't, I can't read everything, but. Um, so yeah, interviewing a, stu a former student about their proposal, their perspectives, their dissertation, uh, uh, preferably an alum. If you choose option B, you can write to me for names and emails of people. If you want to interview someone from Taiwan or from Korea or from Turkey or from another country, I have, I have index names of people from other, different countries around the world, and I'll send you a couple of names of people to interview. Um, I'm going to stop sharing at this point. 
does does anything not make sense in what in canvas in the syllabus in dropbox does anyone want to comment or we're getting really yep i have a just a quick question yep my battery is about ready to go but um so i'm just trying to get a timeline for things um so we we're taking 70 795 right now and for edd people um and then march 30th uh we'll be taking quals if we decide to do that um so then where when do we do our proposal after this class we set that up with our advisor and yeah you're writing it your final task five is basically your proposal thus far it won't be complete so you'll complete it typically after this class some people are ambitious and do finish it within this class but typically you still have to meet with your advisor you have to flesh out the literature review more you know and then get approval everyone has to read it so you'll finish it after this class okay yeah that makes sense this gets you on the road to doing it okay. so on that topic we yeah. have our dissertation our we have our qualifying exam committee and then we have a dissertation committee and those aren't necessarily the same people right and i get confused okay. too sometimes i think someone has me on their dissert their qualifying exam committee and i just expect to be on their dissertation committee and then i find out later you're i'm not on it the student okay. decides the student decides <laughs> you're you know whoever you want on it so yeah. i have two questions on that topic one are we able to ask people outside of ist to be on our dissertation committee um and two how do we kind of figure out who we want to have on our dissertation committee because i can say as a distance student i don't know a whole lot i mean like i know some of our faculty but i've a lot of the classes i've taken have been with adjuncts so like so, I've never taken a class with Dr. G. I've taken one with Dr. Bonk. I've never taken one with you before, or with I've never taken one with you. I've taken one with uh one with Dr. Brush. I've never taken a class with Leftwich. Like I don't know. I don't yeah, know that, that. There's there's a problem recently in that they a lot of the faculty have grants. And so they're being bought out and the, the courses are being taught more and more by yeah. adjuncts. I will say that's true during especially in the past year, maybe year and a half, um, or two years. That was not always the case, um, but you only need three. You have your advisor yeah. to begin with. Typically they get, it, it, EDDs no longer have a minor. So that's another issue is that we used to automatically have a minor member plus your advisor. You'd have two out of three. All you need to find is a third. But in your case, you might have to find two other. You have your advisor, Dr. G, yeah. I think you said, right? Yeah. So you're gonna have to find two more people to be on your committee. And, and okay. it depends on your topic. Um, I have forgotten already. That's um, okay. Um, are we able to ask people that are outside of IST? Yes. Um, okay, I, because like I I want to do a program evaluation and I just took a class with Dr. Rakowski and he has offered to provide guidance and help if you want to actually do the evaluation. Right. So, so I thought if he, yeah. So if he, he is willing to, I think he'd be great for me. Right. I've seen him on the trails. He's him and his wife. Or he ran a hundred mar mar uh, ultra marathon recently. Um, I could never do that. Oh, no. Uh, no. So I, he'd be good. But I think you have to have at least two IST people. Two. Okay. So that's my yeah. understanding of the rules. Okay. It's, it's difficult to know all the rules for all the programs, but I'm pretty sure you have okay. to have two out of three IST and you can have an outside member probably from any department at IU. Okay. Um, as long as they're on the graduate faculty, which he is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So then talking to uh, Dr. Glazewski about who would be right. best for my topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. You know, okay. And you can talk to me because I'm, you know, during the one. Well, yeah. <laughs> stuff. And you can talk to others too. So, you know, we can help, all help advise. And by the end of the semester, I'm sure you'll have names, you know, okay. to, 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 to do. Um, I think I'll spend soon may five minutes, just a few writing tips and I'm going to end. I just want to give a few and get me started. So I'll finish that next week, parts nine and 10. Um, any other questions or comments? Everyone Chris, Chris, 
Oh, yeah. Chris. Um, for going back to the timeline piece, um, so if we're going to have half of our dissertation proposal written or aim to have it halfway, at least halfway by the end of this uh, semester, um, what are we looking at for the summer semester? Like, if are we able to enroll in the dissertation, or is there some is there some, some I don't I'm not sure what goes in that. Whatever you don't have finished, you're writing the rest on your own without taking a class. Okay. It's it's okay. on your own. It could be you finish writing it during Christmas break if you don't want to do anything in the summer or fall, and you want to you know you have time on your hands, or you might write it during the summer break. Um, you know so, you're working full time, right? I assume. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. So once once you or once it's finished and approved, then you can take the dissertation uh, in summer, like or not summer. Sorry, just this dissertation on that semester. That following semester. Oh, the seven nine nine class. I, I yeah. Yeah, Sunmei is taking our seven nine nine, right, Sunmei? Yeah, you can take that one during summer. That's because one of my you know peers actually took that course during that summer and after that last four. Actually, you know, actually seven ninety nine can be from one unit to three unit. So just to, you can choose any unit. So actually for her, just she took the one unit during summer and then last semester, three unit and this semester, three unit and make, you know, no, two, two unit this time. It's a total six unit. We okay. can use that course two times. So and you can use that. Yeah. And so that course, are you able to spend time doing your proposal or when? When are you able to do that? I think Dr. Bonk, you answered that, right? I think it's after you defend your proposal. Isn't that right, Sunmei? You can't take 799 till you defend your proposal? Or... No, I don't think so. That's because yeah. that that friends actually took that before defend the proposal. So actually she did actually October, but during the summer, she worked on her proposal. Yeah. That's because her advisor we casted to revise multiple times. She, yeah, so you can do that. But wait I don't minute. know how no, many. That's, can... that, that's more confusing now. Wait a minute. Yeah. Say, say it more simply. Can people take R799 before they defend their proposal? Before? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can. That's possible. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because but... Jen Hatfield did that too, because she wasn't able right? to get her yeah. proposal yeah. defense until the end of the semester because of timing and such. I think 799 is not like a good formal class it's just a no place it's a place holder. Still 799 right. is yeah. a placeholder for people until the right, right exactly. after courses are done after quals are done 799 right. is a placeholder just to make sure you're in the system and we don't lose track right of you. okay that's, that's yeah. really let good me, to know. Yeah. yeah let me clarify i think that after this class you can take that class yeah and if then you've taken everything also else. you have to yeah you have to finish the all required coursework. Okay, and then yes. you can take that one. Okay. Okay. Regardless yeah. of taking the, you know, defense yeah. or not. Yeah. That makes that makes a lot more sense. Um okay. Thank you so much. For PhD <laughs> students, it helps them to get insurance when they're on campus because they're not taking normally you have to take at least six credit hours to get insured. So if they have a baby, you know, while they're a student here, they get it all paid for by the university. But if they're not taking mm -hmm. any classes. 799 becomes a class that's in a marker for them. So it's, it serves different purposes for EED students and PhD students, but it's important. And again, not to, not to lose track of people and to, and to make sure they're checking in with us. They might have decided to go back home to Indonesia, which some one of mine's planning to do and finish dissertation there, but 799 becomes a way for her every semester to check in with me, you know, and yeah. for us, us to collect a little bit of money from people. It's not a lot of money, but it's just a little bit of money. Um, yeah. And I, I believe there's also the access to the resources as well. Yeah. Like the, the, so that I think that would be very useful. Yeah, your email account will still exist and you can access library resources. All that's right. under 799 umbrella. You know, okay. you can go, go to cheaper at a football game, basketball games as a student, you know, until you graduate. Um, yeah, you can get, and you can go to all Big Ten campuses, even though you're in New Mexico, 
all big to and, and any university in the country that has edu rome i think it's called edu rome mm -hmm. or something like that you can get free internet access at any campus um that has a Jerome most of the big tens have it so I can go to Wisconsin and get free internet so there's a couple other benefits um yeah. in the in the big ten using library resources and things like that too yeah yeah okay I'm going to show just a few writing tips let me I don't think we want to go too long here so I'll just give a, a couple quick ones here so again Mena and I have been working on ideas related to um writing and publishing and I'm trying to I've got this toolbar that keeps wanting to come at me on the front there we go I've got it on top and on bottom now finally and we've got a 10-part writing tips and guidelines we call it the g3 of writing gentle guidelines great stories and gigantic scholarly gains and so um, I have little Snoopy peanuts cartoons in each of the 10 sections dividing up the 10 sections um, so it's just a little humor in here. Here's the world's uh, the world's famous author is on his way to mail his latest novel to the publisher. Uh, and it says, I didn't know mailboxes could run. Um, it's kind of like the way my publishers always run away from you um, when you think you got something important to share with them. I know I had that experience in my world is open book uh, and so forth. Anyways, this, this little 10 part thing is on trying to create celebrations and not frustrations simple suggestions, simplifications, and celebrations. We've already asked your research topic. Um, so there's different articles that I've summarized in this 10 part. One of the articles is by Lewis um, Bert, Burton Lewis Jr. in Inside Higher Education. And he had this you know, graphic in there just said accepted, trying to get your work accepted. He had advice for writing and finishing your dissertation, which I thought is important for all of you. He says to write in small bits, kind of like what Therese says, just knock something out. You know, put the acknowledgments in, if nothing else. <laughs> if they, if your university requires a biography, put that in there, a table of contents, anything that you feel like you accomplished something. It says bird by bird, bit by bit, you'll feel better about yourself. Um, you know, so, you, and then as Jennifer pointed out, find your motivation for writing. As Therese pointed out, find out who your stakeholders are. Who's your audience? For Jennifer and for myself, it was getting a job, which was really stressful. It, it caused us to finish, but we also saw the doctor, or she should have seen the doctor. She had some health issues, she, as she alluded to, in writing, including COVID, in writing the dissertation. But find your motivation for writing. Find your passion. Once you find your passion, keep reflecting on that passion, that motivation, that driving force to finishing. That's extremely important. You know, there's there's a notion of having a get done dissertation and a and a make a difference dissertation, but there's also a difference between doing a dissertation for someone else or something else and doing something that you find valuable and important and passionate about. Write a story, um, just a, a little write a little anecdote just to loosen up your thoughts, just to get you be more creative. And from that story that you might write, though narrative, you might be interviewing people for your dissertation. Some some um, point along the way. Write a little story from that might loosen up some thoughts. Recognize that writing is writing. Writing, just writing and don't, you know, I often thought I should have a study where we turn the screen off and compare students writing for those that turn their screen off and those that could see the entire screen and those who could only see a couple lines and look at the creativity embedded in the process. Um, but, you know, if you get fixated on punctuation, wording, and grammar, if you're a, an anal accountant like I am, and just I edited a document yesterday where uh, Dr. Kwan wrote, which had two spaces between sentences in some part and one space between a sentence. He goes, "Well, what did you revise?" I said, "I just took out the extra space." You know, he he thought I made a lot of revisions. Well, you know, if you get so worried about the spaces and the punctuation, you you don't focus on the 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 gist of what you're trying to say. But writing, you know, writing something, writing a note in your page, it doesn't have to be on screen, just writing just your, your notes on a piece of paper, writing your table of contents, writing your acknowledgments, and then taking breaks, as we did in here earlier, taking breaks and looking and stretching. I have a stand-up desk, so I can lift it up and I can have it go down, and then every once in a while I have to move because I have a back issue. 
And so I can't be sitting like I am right now for too long or, you know, I have a lower back issue. So I have to move about and stretch and do other kinds of things. Um, Alexandra Gold talked about revising and resubmitting in steps. Um, and this is an important article in terms of her dissertations. So tackling revisions on a dissertation. She says there's a huge difference between surf surf surface level superficial editing and proofreading and in-depth revising. And that is very true. So your advisor or your members of your committee might ask for changes and you might list the changes as um, easy to do, medium and very difficult to do. And you might start with the easy ones and tackle them and just get them out of the way. Um, some things tend to be very easy, like you know, cutting down the introduction potentially, like I did in a paper yesterday, I cut down a little bit of the ending. Um, sometimes your introduction is long and rambling, she points out, and incoherent. So try, try to be, you know, um, pithy about it. Try to focus that introduction so people understand what you're trying to do. And that's why we write prospectuses, in effect. Um, reworking the intro often is, is easier once you know where your argument is going. Okay, that's true. Start with a list or a flowchart or a table or a timeline. Start with something that can give you a game plan for where you're headed and you have that target, those goals, as Teresa's pointing out, have those goals uh, in mind when you're doing your dissertation. Have that timetable or that, that um, list of steps, that to-do list, um, the flow chart, as she said, and then make a revisionary plan and stick to that. Say, I'm, these are the items that need to be revised and these are the things I'll do today or might do tomorrow and then check them off on the list one at a time. And she says, and many people I'll point out this semester say the same thing, do small revisions first and then do the larger ones. Get those little things out of the way and then your mind can focus on the bigger chunks of items or issues. Now I will say at dissertation defenses, I've been on over 120 of them. I've had two that had no changes. So almost everyone has changes. About 10 to 20% are like Teresa's of very minor changes, but maybe maybe about 20% are very minor. You know, about 40 to 50% of you know, something substantive that has to change. Uh, and and then Another 10 to 20 percent have a lot of things that have to change, you know, but it's not not a, most dissertation on the middle camp. There's some revisions. There might be something substantive in nature, but it won't be too arduous. It typically takes a month, a month and a half to make most changes of a dissertation. Some only take two weeks. Some take four to six months. Um, but typically we try to get people to the point when they defend where they only have, you know, four weeks three weeks, four weeks of changes, and they can be done. Recently, I see that dissertations are getting better in that regard. Um, I don't know if it's the mentoring or if it's just students giving each other advice, but I haven't seen, except for one of the 13 I was on last year that had major, major changes. I'm trying to think in my head. One definitely had. Um, so make a revision plan and stick to it. If you have a, a problematic section or a chapter or so, you might move on to another section and write that first or revise that first and then come back to it. Um, she also points out that no such thing as wasted writing. I, I agreed with that. I think all ideas are beneficial somewhere. You might delete them from your dissertation, but you just save them somewhere. I call that starter text. Um, I call that, you know, just prose that you can reuse later. Um, so never delete anything, just move it to another file. Um, you know, you, you there, there's, there's really um, no mm, barrier to, all, with the memory size, I have eight terabytes on my desktop. You can save everything on eight terabytes. Of course, my hard disk is dead now, or it may be dead. Um, find scraps of paper, Alexandra says, you know, uh, do not delete your early work, save it for a rainy day. Don't delete it. Don't delete it. Don't delete it. Just save it on the side, have dummy documents. She says she has a habit of just, you know, copy and paste into a different document, a different folder, even your half-baked ideas, even things you don't think will work. Just save them, save them somewhere and just have a different file name for them. I have a desktop that just says work file. 
I have work file by year and by months. I have everything in the work file and it's just saved when I need it. Each paper has additional files. Just they're there. If the, if the reviewers want it, they can, they can get it. So um, sometimes it might just be odd humor as she points out. Um, defamiliarize your work. Uh, you won't catch mistakes if you're too close to it. So you can defamiliarize by going to bed and waking up the next day, taking a vacation, going running, um, talking to your friends, uh, just going to the show, going to a movie, just getting away from it for a bit or putting it away for two weeks or a month. Uh, so you have to walk away for a bit. She says, um, write and revise in different fonts is helpful. Just I find that revising in yellow highlight is helpful because then I can see what I changed. Some people like track changes. That tends to work in the first revision, second revision. When I get to the third revision and fourth revision, I revise with yellow highlights. And that helps me become a better writer because I, I know what I changed. Read aloud your words, talk, you know, speak them, see how they sound out loud. That uh, will help you at the macro level a bit. Outline your main points of what you're saying in the paper. Outline your revisionary points. And then cut up the paper paragraph by paragraph and play around with the order. You might move paragraphs around at the structural level. I think I'll stop here and I'll go on to this stuff next time. Um, how to avoid failing your dissertation soon. That's what we'll start with, how to avoid failing. So let me hit the stop and just say thanks for staying extra this week. And um, hopefully we... we hit a lot of important points in week one in here. Is there anything I haven't responded to? So um, I will say thanks to Sunme. I'm gonna stop the recording. Uh, stop the recording, this will go to Zoom. Week one, R795 is done.